And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state, its fascist communist corporations, and the servile society. I'm your host Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise, uh, where we are busy making plans for 2021, uh, the focus being food self-sufficiency. Uh, next month, we'll begin bird egg incubation here, uh, chickens, ducks, uh, quail, turkey, and uh, in the spring, we'll be starting zone one of our permaculture farm uh, right out my front window here, actually. Uh, primarily squash, onions, and a uh, couple other vegetables that uh, chickens and ducks will enjoy foraging for. And uh, over the next year or so, the birds will fertilize the area, and uh, then we'll have superb soil for uh, for whatever. So basically, I've got just a grass a grass front yard now, and uh, going to put a bunch of birds on there and let them uh, let them shit, and it's gonna it's gonna be great. <laughs> so yeah, next uh, I guess also also worth mentioning is uh, in the spring we'll we'll patch a uh, small pond that's here on the property and uh, add some fish. Uh, with a small pump, it could be used for tap water and shower water too. So, that's a step towards the uh, the off grid too. So, um, I mean, and I, I thought about that too. Like, I was the the initial idea was just to patch the pond for you know so it could fill up and and put some put some fish in there. But hell, yeah, you just toss a pump in there and you got uh, you got uh, shower water, tap water too. But uh, anyway, yeah, big things in the works here at Pasnia. Uh, would love for you to get involved uh, to learn more or to become an honorary stakeholder. Just visit Pasnia. Dot com and Pasnia is spelled P A Z N I A. Uh, Pasnia.com. Today I've got a two episode re release, uh, some old yet evergreen content from our direct action series over at Liberty Attack Radio, uh, which is now Liberty Attack Publications, of course. Here in Colin, I provide an overall analysis on Vanu and compare and contrast it with other philosophies and strategies. In total, I think these originally summed to like seven hours of live radio, so all that remains is the most valuable stuff, uh, at least in my humble opinion. If you're new to the podcast and or Vanu, I would definitely recommend starting back at episode one. Uh, you can find our full archives by visiting vanupodcast.com uh, forward slash episodes. As I close out here and uh, as we collectively close out 2020, uh, I want to thank all of you uh, who are out there planting the seeds of self-liberation, uh, whatever that entails, uh, whether you're sharing episodes of the podcast with folks you know uh, or developing Vanu in your own way, it all helps move things in uh, the right direction. Uh, lots to come indeed, but I'll uh, leave it there for now. Uh, please enjoy this classic episode of Liberty Air Attack Radio, and always remember, Vonnie was yours for the making. Tonight we plan we'll be uh, providing an overall analysis of Rayo's book, Vonnie, The Search for Personal Freedom, and the theory and practice behind it. Uh, if you listen to last Sunday's show, uh, you heard uh, section one of two from the book, and uh, have a decent idea of the thinking that prompted uh, Rayo to, uh, uh, to begin formulating uh, Vonnie. Uh, that said, if you missed it for any reason or want to check out Section 2, just visit tinyurl.com forward slash Vani Rayo. And I think the discussion we'll have tonight will, uh, if, you ha- if you haven't uh, wanted to listen to it yet, I think this discussion tonight will definitely, will definitely encourage you to. Um, so, uh, yeah, on that, at that link you'll find uh, both sections of the audiobook as uh, well as the PDF version of the book. So I mentioned this on Sunday, but there's a very good reason for a multiple show in-depth discussion uh, regarding Vanu. Uh, first off, it gives us an idea of the struggles between political crusading and those utilizing uh, the economic means back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, secondly, Vani was certainly a strategy in creating your own freedom now without asking for permission. Uh, that being the case, it will definitely be added uh, to the next edition of the Food Up. I don't think it's on there yet. I mean, maybe I don't know it as well as I should, but I don't think it's on there yet. And Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, but yeah, let's, let's go ahead and get into it a little bit. I'd like to start with just like a brief introduction of Vani. And this is on the solutions page uh, in the profiling archive on the website. Uh, but Vanu is an anti-political lifestyle and strategy of voluntary social exclusion, whose ideal goal is to become as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible. The strategy of Vanu varies on an individual basis. Uh, for example, you could have a lot of interaction with the statist servile society while importing, exporting. Uh, you could become completely self-sufficient and move far out in the woods and many combination in between. Vanu can be done individually uh, with a freemate, uh, a companion, or it can be done in a small or large group depending on your goals. Uh, although Rayo does recommend Vanuing by yourself first as a psychological test of your mind. Can I handle this lifestyle change? There are multiple strategies of Vanu discussed, and then we'll get into each of these. Uh, RV living, tent camping, uh, living on the water, Vanuing in cities, among others. Uh, some may choose to go that route, uh, go, to the route go the route that Rayo took, and disappear completely. 
uh, and you guys will hear uh, the epilogue, which is about a minute audio clip, but uh, I think it's a really interesting chapter. Uh, as mentioned previously, it does depend on your goals, uh, your strengths, and the current uh, political climate. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and read the table of contents from the book uh, real quick. So you give, you, give you an idea of, uh, of what he talks about here. So section one, theory. What does freedom mean? How to develop liberty at a profit? Uh, some thoughts on libertarian strategy times three. Some thoughts on freedom strategy times two. Uh, thoughts on freedom strategy trade-offs. Thoughts on freedom strategy utopias. Uh, that's where he critiques uh, anarcho-capitalism. Uh, a case for non-coercion based on rational self-interest. And there you can see some more Randian influence. Uh, section two, practice, uh, self-seeking, free isles, self-seeking, green revolution, self-seeking, take over a state, self-seeking, ethical enclave, black markets, self-seeking, international seamobile, a uh, letter from a nomad. They, someone sent in a letter to one of the magazines uh, that, that Rio published and uh, just his experiences on, uh, on van li- uh, being a van nomad. Uh, choosing a van for living aboard. Uh, so if you're wanting to go live in your RV and drive around and, and stay on public land and such, it's a good chapter for you. Uh, further report on shelter. He just analyzes the shelter. Uh, 40 by 8 feet of shelter and $30 in one day. More on shelter. Uh, foods for storage and preliminary suggestions. Uh, soybeans. Uh, opting out. Vanu economic strategies on acquisition of private land. Vanu and cities. A survey of Siski region. A search of Dr. G and Rayo. Report on progress and problems and epilogue, the disappearance. So that's uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, with section one theory uh, and then work to section two practice. But first, it's important to st- it's important to start with with saying only libertarians vanu. And I'm going to use libertarians in this broadcast because that he does essentially call libertarians or vanuans, but um, only libertarians vanu. Only people that. Um, oh. Only people that consciously want to escape the state and change their lifestyle in such a manner where they try to become as invulnerable to coercion as they possibly can. Uh, some conservatives, progressives, fascists, etc., practice survivalism, uh, frugalism, uh, etc., but they don't take it to the extreme uh, like von Ehlins do. Uh, so, Kyle, before we get into the, before we move forward into uh, uh, analyzing uh, section one and section two, uh, is there anything you want to mention, real quick? Yes, authoritarians suck, and uh, Rayo said that at uh, quite some length. That that that's all I've got for right now. <laughs> good deal, good deal. And okay. Jason, uh, stand, feel free. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm, I I agree with Kyle. Cool, cool. Okay, and we're only going to briefly uh, discuss Section One Theory because uh, obviously that's available at the website, and we uh, played Section One uh, last Sunday, and uh, Jason and I kind of discuss some interesting points. So um, Rayo rejected reformism outright. Uh, He he had derisive terms like political crusading and bullshit libertarianism. I love that one a lot. Uh, I really, really do. Uh, Because we're pretty hostile towards reformists here at Liberty Under Attack, as you guys are are well aware. Uh, But he he viewed the absence of coercion as important than vulnerability to coercion. So um, Kyle, uh, anything there for section one? Well, let me just let me just point something out. When this, I guess you could call it that the, the Vanu book itself is an anthology of of his various articles and such. But just keep in mind, just for the listeners, when this uh, anthology was published, I think it was 1983, I believe, and the correct, articles correct, themselves yeah. were published between you know the 60s and 70s. So keep that in mind when it comes to the uh, the partyarchy of the LP, Rayo was critiquing all of that stuff all those decades ago. Yeah, and I guess before the Libertarian Party was even founded. Yep. And I guess the question for the listeners to contemplate is uh has anything really changed with uh you know whether it was Mark Feldman or Daryl Perry or any of these uh schmucks from last go- this current going around where they're saying you must vote even though I'm an anarchist politician and all this stuff. So 2016 this year, they were saying all of that, and you must vote, Feldman especially. But what did Rayo say back in the 60s and 70s? And is it really any different? And, and the most pertinent thing is, are Rayo's observations less relevant today than they were back then? Yeah, that's, that, that's definitely a good point and some, some good, one, good things to point out there. Um, but uh, 
Uh, but yeah, I'd also recommend, and I, I've been I've been digging through like just like the libertarian history from like the '60s to like the '80s uh, in the past uh, in the past few days, and it's fascinating. There's an there's a, an interview I put up with Samuel Conkin, and he kind of walks through like all of the overlap between these folks and all of the things that like all of the I guess I guess like I guess the movement in general, what was happening then is is so fascinating uh, because I didn't know I didn't know it was uh, that uh, that large and that active. Um, and now, unfortunately, it seems like the the only really places that are active, uh, uh, Libertarian Party, definitely one of them, uh, Free State Project is pretty active, I would say, uh, and then some some obviously the uh, underground agorist. Before we went to break, we were, we kind of touched on Section One theory very very briefly, and now we're actually going to get into the practice of it. And obviously, this is the direct action series, and we pretty much focus on solutions. So uh, this fits in very, very well uh, with what we've been focusing on for, well, it'll be seven months by the time we're finished with it. But uh, that said, um, in this in section two, a lot of it is essentially dedicated to survivalis survivalism and self-sufficiency. Um, there are a couple of few chapters that are all about, like, how to store food, uh, what foods are best to store, uh, where to find where to find the uh, where to find the food locally there in the 60s and 70s, which obviously is probably not applicable today. Uh, there's a big section about uh, uh, what maps you should get if you're going to be like driving around on public land and such. Uh, but uh, so yeah, a lot of it's dedicated to survivalism and self-sufficiency. So I wanted to put put that out there because we're going to kind of skip over those sections um, just for for the sake of time and how much we actually have to uh, to discuss. Uh, there's also some mention of perpetual traveling. Uh, people that don't actually have a home, they just move every few months or whenever they feel like it. Uh, much like uh, Pete Sisko, who I'm hoping to get booked on here, uh, and also uh, Jake DeSillis, uh, who uh, we interviewed him on uh, January 17th of this year. So if you want to check out that interview, uh, you definitely can. Essentially, uh, what Rayo talked about there was don't spend your money in the country where you work. So his, his example was work in the United States and live in the Bahamas. And you'll, uh, you'll essentially be um, unmolested there since you aren't actually – um, producing income. You're just spending money. So um, the next important section, this is kind of interesting because there, there are a number of predictions here um, in, in, in Vaughn of the Search Personal Freedom. Uh, this chapter is called Self-Seeking Takeover of State, and here's a quote. Um, a correspondent in Illinois who prefers not to be identified suggests a state could be taken over. By everyone moving to one state, a concentration of effort and voice could be obtained. A state like Oregon would be ideal, low population, varied topography and climate, coastal state for shipping, etc., there would still be federal laws, though, unless freedom was so well sold that the state might try secession, end quote. What does that sound like to you guys? <laughs> well, sounds like the Free State Project to me, uh, which was founded in 2001. Uh, so that was recommended as a potential solution uh, by Rayo. Uh, we only have one limits test at this. Well, I guess there's there, there's other. I guess there is a Blue Ridge Liberty Project. There's a couple of other ones, but the Free State Project is, I, I would I would say, the the most well known. And uh, they really haven't done anything, have they, guys? Well, I mean, Shane, I think I've I've criticized them before. I I, I think that's kind of obvious. And you know, but, but you know, look at it look at it another way. I mean, there's other attempts to basically try to kind of do things with the. Uh, I will call them the provincial governments because we might as well be in Canada. Because remember, they have a federal government too. Uh, <laughs> look at a lot of the tenthers, you know, the guys who want to use the so-called state nullification thing to basically kind of repeal a lot of the laws. Look at the so-called constitutional sheriffs and that craziness. Look at, um, you know, even competitors to the FSP. You mentioned one of them. Well, another one would be the American readout uh, concept. Uh, and so forth. So this idea of of trying to go for not dealing with the federal uh, government directly, but more dealing with the other American governments, the ones that are, much as Thomas Jefferson put it, the most important government is the one that's closest to you. It, it's more in that vein. But of course, I would kind of suggest that, uh, <laughs> let me put it this way, if people went on political field trips, I think they would uh, more likely than not seriously reevaluate uh, this whole let's, uh, let's infiltrate the closest government and, uh, and somehow turn that into a benevolent monopoly. Yeah, that, that that is very true, and, and obviously both both you and I, Kyle, went on our, our circuits at political field trips. Me, just one. You, you went on a couple, a uh, couple few. But uh, yeah, local government is just as evil as the uh, 
I mean, they're, they're evil too. They're evil too, and it's not. Uh, it's not. A, it's 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 not a. It's not a cuddly little te- teddy bear uh, compared to the federal government, not in the least sense. Uh, but I actually thought of something, and and, and this is something Dave actually put in chat. Uh, but I thought of Liberate RVA, like that's that's a sort of thing like this, and that might be the only, like that might be the one of the ones that has uh, has pro- like proven success, like at least uh, or or at least there's uh, potential uh, potential for success. Um, Dave mentioned. Uh, uh, Midwest Peace and Liberty Coalition. Um, I, I would say, yeah, get people into Michigan. Yeah, that's that. That would be that would kind of, that would be similar to this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, I mean, I, I would just kind of suggest that as long as there's no reformism going on, and for the listeners who may not know what that term is, working inside of the system in order to change it from within, which my first book was all about. Uh, you know, as long as you're not doing any of that voting petitioning. Uh, protesting, uh, suing the government recklessly and whatever the hell else, as long as you're not begging the state for favors, then generally speaking, you know, if you want to just kind of get together with people, shake hands, form cooperatives and all that sort of stuff voluntarily, um, I see no reason how that would violate the principles of liberty. The only concern I have, Shane, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that, that the way it was described in the Vanu book was... Is, is that the whole concept of taking over a, let's say, provincial government would involve some degree of, of electioneering and running for public office and infiltrating the state and all of that. I mean, am I, am I off base there? No, no, I, I, I definitely wouldn't. Uh, I, I, I definitely don't think you are. Um, and, and that's like that. I guess that's that's one organ. Like Liberate RVA definitely doesn't uh, do any reformism. So that that's that's a good thing. Um, but 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 yeah. So so that's I, I think we've we've kind of covered that. So yeah, I mean that at that time, I'm not sure if there were. Uh, I, I guess uh, in one of the articles I read, um, Conkin and some other agoras and some other anarchists. Um, I guess moved to. I don't think it might have been San Francisco or something, and like shared an apartment complex like they they rented out all the rooms and just ran out to their friends uh but i don't know if that'd be the same thing as what ray was referring to here they were definitely weren't trying to uh uh take over a state or anything they just went their 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 people congregated congregated together so um <clears throat> but but Brio did mention something interesting and obviously that 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 re- uh, reader from illinois back in the 60s when this article was written 60s or 70s um he mentioned oregon as like the ideal place but rayo didn't actually think that it, it, it was um he thought a place like uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco would be better, uh, considering like most of the libertarians in the world at that time uh, lived like in those big cities. So um, it was kind of interesting. It's typically, uh, when I think of when I think of moving somewhere, the last place I'll move to is like, well, you know, move to move to like a, the, one of the biggest cities in the United States. No, not going to happen. I'm not going to do that. That's not my style. <laughs> um, back to uh, before we went on the break. We were talking about the the timelessness of this. I, I'm just amazed. It it it's it was what probably about forty forty five years ago, and a lot of the topics that were in that book are still prevalent today. I mean, you know, his whole debate on whether eating organic or not, and I believe he also did bring up a uh, Monsanto or one of the articles. Yeah, he, you know. he mentioned. Yeah, yeah, he mentioned Monsanto was more in regards to the uh, propyl. Uh, what was it? The uh, propylene a tenths yeah. or something like uh, poly- the polypropylene. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah that, I thought I thought that was interesting. You know, especially in the theory too. I mean, it, it's it's still. I mean, <laughs> it's it's timeless. I mean, I think we could put the. I think we can wrap this book up, bury it, dig it up in another forty years, and it, <laughs> it would still be good to go. Yeah. Well, gee, well, in one sense, I hope not, because that would kind of imply that uh, a lot of these reformists have uh, still enjoy quite a bit of support, wouldn't it? I mean, look at the other side of the issue by, by what you're kind of implying. Now, you well, may very well be right, but but just think the other side of the coin there for a second. Well, th- well, the good news is is there's actually uh, liberty and freedom for people who want to drop off the face of the planet. You know, uh, yeah, sure, you can have liberty and freedom, but you basically have to um, go into hiding, I guess, or underground. Yeah. I mean, 
there, there, there's there's a number of ways to bond, and we'll, we'll get into those here momentarily. But but this was uh, this was another really really interesting part of the book. Um, it was a chapter called "Self Seeking Ethical Enclave Black Markets," and uh, mind you, this was before Konkin. This was before any Libertarian Manifesto or Agorist Primer were published. So this was this this predates Konkin uh, and Agorism. So uh, there's one really interesting quote, and it, it, it just defines what what he's talking about here. Quote: "An ethical enclave is defined here as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when su when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic." of the participating individuals, an adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate force or threat of violence against another. And enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity, end quote. Uh, so he's, well, he's way ahead of all this stuff. He definitely was. Uh, definitely a, a really, really good theorist and he even put his theory into practice. So uh, guys, what, what do you think? I think I, I really do think Rail was ahead of his time and a pioneer. I mean, the specific article on the ethical enclave that was published in November of '65. So yeah, by the time that the articles were compiled into the anthology of what is now the book on Vanu Vanu, the search for personal freedom, uh, in '83. You know, it's like, well, I mean, I guess somebody could arguably uh, try to say that Con that he was a contemporary of Konkin, but then when you actually look at the book, it's like, wait a minute, this is a compilation. He wrote the, this particular one was in 65. Then that would mean he actually came before Konkin. So maybe, wait, is it completely unreasonable to assume that maybe Konkin got the idea from him, at least in part, and then he further developed it in terms of a, uh, oh, what the hell, a revolutionary strategy possibly? And that that's an interesting thought too. Like uh, I wish Conklin was last so I could ask him. But uh, and that that's that's one reason I've been digging through like all all of this historical libertarian literature and and, and the articles and the interviews because I want to see like how influential Rayo really was. I mean, obviously in that Liberty, Liberty Magazine, nineteen eighty seven. Um, there were a couple, few articles talking about him, but I don't know how influential he actually was uh, on folks there. Like maybe he was uh, maybe he was so ahead of his time that even uh, even a lot of those folks kind of overlooked him, and it was kind of a uh, um, it was kind of a fringe thing. I, I remember in that book uh, mentioned uh, uh, like a thousand subscribers is like the, the maximum they had at one time for one of those magazines. So like this wasn't like. There was no uh, critical mass or anything with this. It was just people that were interesting, interested in uh, not participating in reformism and uh, just saying, you know, screw it. I'm going to create my own freedom right now, uh, which is much like what we're trying to push here on Libertarian Attack Radio. So, uh, um, Jason, Stan, uh, Kyle? I'll say this much. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us do appreciate Dr. Rothbard quite a bit for his valuable contributions. However, the guy awfully, was awful of a theorit theoretician, right? I mean, he was talking about economics quite a bit, but when it comes down to doing things, that's not Rothbard's strong suit. If you contrast him with Rayo, Rayo didn't just do theory. He went beyond that. It's like, okay, I'm going to experiment with the polypropylene tent and, you know, the, oh, the whole entire chapter of living on boats, too. Uh, like, like, Rayo was actually much more of an engineer trying to like, you know, poke at things and say, hmm, do I get more or less freedom with this? Let's, hey kids, let's go and, you know, give it a try. Whereas, unfortunately, Dr. Rothbard was uh, playing the political crusading game uh, with the LP. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he definitely was. He definitely was. Uh, and in that, I mentioned the interview with Conkin again, a really fascinating interview. Uh, yeah, he mentioned there, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know actually happened and um, like all the, all the party archy that happened then. Uh, back then, obviously, I knew it happened, but uh, just the details uh, and what actually transpired is is, is fascinating. So, um, yeah, provided a good transition there, Kyle. Self-seeking, international sea mobile. Um, so, I'm going to start off with a quote here, and this is the most fascinating thing, like the most fascinating chapter that I that I read. Like, it literally makes me want to just like buy a freaking boat and just go out there and live on the water. Uh, but I'd probably die pretty quickly because I'm not that. I don't know. <laughs> but so anyways, quote, as more libertarians take to the water, some will doubtless anchor and migrate more or less together as a semi-permanent waterborne community, saving time and money through the exchange of services. Internal free trade not subject to the scrutiny of any state. The voluntary floating association has some advantages over the free hamlet in the hills. Not only will anchors be lowered where state interference is minimal, the very mobility discourages intervention. Uh, for instance, state school officials seldom molest the children of transients. 
Another blessing for parents, the irrationalist, coercivist influence of outside peer groups and mass communication media is considerably reduced. Uh, where was I? Uh, differences of objective and conflicts of personality which may disrupt an immobile intentional community are easily resolved. The dissenters weigh anchor. And a community can develop by easy steps and without formal direction. No would-be founder need acquire a large tract of land uncertain as to market demand or the response of the state. The floating voluntary society uh, being uh, begins with a population of one. End quote. Hey, let's name another prediction, right? How many of you guys have heard of the Seasteading Institute? Me. <laughs> I know, I know what you have, Kyle, and I'm, I'm pulling up the page. I, I, don't, I don't remember. It's, uh, it's interesting, too, who actually uh, – let's go back to the about page here. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, the Seasetting Institute, that's kind of their goal. <laughs> that is kind of their goal, and it was founded by uh, – um, it was uh, founded in 2008 by Patrick uh, Friedman, grandson of Nobel Prize-winning economist Milton Friedman. So uh, just an interesting little, little fact for you. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Sandy, you, got, you have something to add? Yeah, sounds like a uh, episode uh the SeaWorld movie if it didn't suck. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about uh Waterworld? Or uh, Waterworld, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Okay, yeah, I remember that movie. Yeah. yeah. That's anarchy, it, isn't it? State of nature, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, except I don't know. That movie kind of just sucked. Uh, I enjoyed it when I was like twelve. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense though. <laughs> Keyword twelve. <laughs> right. Oh, and Mr. Producer's being a dick too. Shane, you're probably like five. Yeah, I was young, dude. I was young. <laughs> I remember, and like I was, I was so young. I was so young. I remember watching that like on like on family vacations. Like my mom's like old like whatever she had like an explorer expedition. Like watching it in the little TV screen when we're on vacation. So yeah, it was a long time ago. Fuck off. Wait, uh, you had a TV in your explorer growing up? How rich was, were you? Uh, well, it was it was one of the little just tiny kidding. eight inch screens, so it oh, wasn't. Just shit, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, but uh, so yeah, mm. yeah. You My... said Sea World movie. I was like, what the hell? Sea World movie is is that where they just come out and like beat the killer whales or something? Yeah, mm. something like that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, one thing I did notice when I was listening to the sec- second section, it's got like a. a like a mystical kind of, you know, adventurous, you know, kind of, it's, it, it's just really intriguing, you know, to kind of like picture what life would be like, you know, going on this adventure. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And then there are a number of, there are a number of times like this isn't um, like, they didn't just do this for free. Like uh, obviously they, they, they wanted freedom. That's, that's one, that's one reason they did it, but they found it. I think they, wilderness Vanu is addicting. Um, is, is, uh, something that they said. Um, so yeah, it was addicting. They loved doing it. They loved figuring out these new tactics, these new strategies, and they loved writing about it. So other people could, could, um, could, uh, I guess, uh, mirror their example or emulate their example. Uh, there are even, and, and we're, we're still on topic here, so this is fine, but, um, there was even a couple, a uh, couple of articles that mentioned something called like a Vani Wilderness Week or whatever, Vani Week. So, and, and Rayo actually like, <laughs> and it's funny too. Like you can see how much he invested in security culture. But like for people that he wrote to and trusted, or he got like a he, got, he started trusting them, um, he would like guide them out to like where where he was staying or close to it with like uh, um, like encrypted maps and stuff and like clues and like all this stuff to like get him there. Uh, someone else would find out where he was. Uh, but yeah, a couple of those articles posted mentioned Vani Week, and one of them is by Ben Best, and he actually attended uh, Vani Week. Um, so you kind of get an insight on, on Rayo's personality uh, and what he was fearful of. He was very fearful of nuclear attacks for, for some reason. I guess in that time, I, it, it's not necessarily um, – no, it, uh, it, it would be because of the Cold War. Yeah, yes. a lot of propaganda going on during that time. I mean, hell, they were what teaching kids to <laughs> hide under their desk from a fucking nuclear duck attack. Duck and cover, <laughs> duck and cover. You won't get incinerated, but you will. <laughs> it's easier to count all the, you know, scorch marks if they're lower to the ground, I guess. Oh, I, I didn't think Danny was here, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> hey. you know, Stan, Stan does that. Stan does have that. Like he'll like he'll mention something like that. Like every once in a while, it's fantastic. The darkness. Like he, 
<laughs> yeah, the, the I guess the, the the brutalist side of, of Stan. Yeah, it, it only I comes out. When it only comes out when it's a full moon. Yeah, I was just <laughs> thinking of what, back to what I learned and what uh, from watching a World War II documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh shit. Yeah, and for, and you weren't those... the only one who left Scourge Marks. I just remembered. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and just for for the for the people listening on the live stream, I guess Skype wants to be a bitch and it's not willing to video, but we can still continue. Uh, but yeah, an interesting little discussion there. Um, anything else on? Uh, um, we'll, we'll get more into into this this uh, the sea living here momentarily, and we just start discussing some other interesting aspects. Um, but uh, anything else before we move forward? Nope. 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 Okay. All right. Choosing a van for living aboard. Um, so this, this was an interesting one too. Um, but, uh, as, as I mentioned and more towards the introduction, if, if you're looking to like, uh, pursue RV living like, uh, Alex Ansari, uh, Alex Ansari did for a year, uh, this chapter might be useful to you. Uh, he lays out the best van to buy and, uh, the necessary implements and also just some more good advice. Uh, and, uh, we'll get more to this, uh, here momentarily, but, uh, you would need to have proper ID and registration. Um, now, um, Rayo does allude to like, well, you, fake or not, it doesn't matter. You just have to have some sort of identification to, to, uh, trick the bludgies, the bludgies. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, that was, that was an interesting term he, he kind of created or, or, uh, used from somebody else, but. Yeah, as opposed to, as opposed to like blue coats or the gendarmerie or probably most commonly in prison, you'll hear a lot of the inmates say pigs. Yeah, that, that'll be right before the guards, you know, shove their faces into the concrete. But, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of vernacular ways to describe the cops or police officers or so-called law enforcement. And you're right. Rayo's term was, was bludgies, which I, I got to admit, that, that seems awfully cool. It does, yeah. And it's, it's not like, obviously, like, police extortionists is, like, limited to, like, police officers. Or I, I guess it could be for, like, bureaucrats with guns that come to your house, too. But, like, bludgies, like, he doesn't even have, like, enough respect for these people, and, and rightfully so. Like, to say, like, oh, oh, the... Um, I don't know what, what uh, the police extortion is like. If any status employee is just a bludgeon, like that's just. So hold on, hold on. Would that also include the men in the black robes? Oh yeah, yeah I, would, I would say so. Yeah, it was, it was kind of it was kind of universal. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that that would also mean the empty suits who who like to get up to the podiums and say how they want to threaten people this week, or uh, or the other men in suits who like to sit behind a desk and think that they're masters of the universe. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I think it's yeah. Any status employee is that's uh, pretty much yeah. yeah. Or, or or wait wait wait. Or what about the other government employees who wear the green costumes and uh, are right now playing over in the sandbox? Uh, would that would they be bludgies too? Um, uh, good, good question. question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jinx. Yeah, yeah I, I would I would I would say so. I would say so. I don't know. I don't know. I, well, hold on. Let me give Ray a call and let's see what what he what he thinks. <laughs> I'm going to go find him in the woods, guys. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's kind of interesting, right? Because the other terms like blue coats or, or gendarmerie or pigs or whatever, usually that's only limited to the thugs in the blue costumes. But bludgies is interesting because it's like all government employees. So yeah. it really is kind of a catch-all. So whereas some of us will distinguish and will on occasion use the political terms like judges, legislators, bureaucrats, police officers, and soldiers, uh, he was like, no, bludgies. Done. <laughs> you know, done. Yep. Let's yep. get on with life. Indeed, indeed. Um, but yeah, so so we'll go ahead and move forward here and get, like, because the, the, I guess two sections are going to be the bulk of, like, the last uh, two segments of the show. So, um, so yeah, the next two chapters kind of lay out, uh, this is just all discussing the shelter, which it is interesting as all hell. It really is. I mean, you, you take a tent and you get some rope and you um, you, you dig out, like, I, I don't exactly understand how you actually did all these things because the, the diagrams are... Um, yeah, the diagrams from 1970s. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no color images or, or anything like that. So, um, and you can find all of those images in the book available at tinyrail.com forward slash Vanu Rayo. But uh, uh, yeah, he just kind of lays out the shelter, um, things that he found to be successful, uh, and things that weren't successful. So, uh, if you're planning on going and living out in the woods under a, a polypropylene a tent, check it out. <laughs> check it out. <laughs> But think about the the like the actual development in materials since then. 
and the, and the types of you know the types of camping equipment that you could use. I I imagine a lot of a lot of the prices he used for like his uh polypropylene tents and stuff like that are probably still close to the same price today. I mean, probably not that far off for the material. I mean, considering what it probably used to cost to produce material like that as it is today, you know, but when you get into your higher end camping stuff, wow. I mean, it could get, I mean, you're talking, you know, four or $500 tents, but those things can survive like the uh, hell storm. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. And that, that was, yeah. And you mentioned something interesting there. He wasn't a fan of like, like when they first, when they, when they first, when Ray, Ray and Dr. Gather, and just to clarify, like for, for that entire book, you don't know if Dr. Gather is a guy or a girl. Not that it really matters, but like, I didn't know if he was slinging dick with a dude out there in the woods in like the 1960s. So, um, <laughs> Just for clarification, her name was, her name was Roberta. <laughs> so <laughs> her name was Roberta. But whenever they started, uh, when they started vanuing, um, they they split time between their their uh, their camper and the woods, and they bought like one of the army surplus tents. And like the first time, to- they're like one of the first times it rained, it started leaking and soaked all their gear. And he was like, "Yep, fuck this. Uh, we're 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 using a tarp, and that's it." I was like, okay, well. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. But uh, we got a minute, minute and a half left. Any, any, any uh, follow up there before oh. we get to the couple more bigger sections? How do you follow up to that, man? <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, like uh, this. I'll try. If you actually, if folks want to go onto Wikipedia and look up terms like uh, van dwelling, or actually go up on YouTube and type in van dwelling, you can see all sorts of uh, videos that people have been posting of folks right now because of the so called Great Recession. Who are, who are mobile right now. In fact, one uh, documentary that, that people can view for free is called Without Bounds, Perspectiles on Mobile Living, which has a fantastic uh, interviews with people living right now on public lands. And uh, we're here discussing, we're here analyzing Vanu. Um, the book is uh, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo. If you want to check it out, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Vanu Rayo. Or what I would recommend rather is just go to the website and search for Vanu and you'll find a handful of articles, uh, the book, and some some other interesting stuff. Uh, so you can, I mean, <clears throat> and uh, someone in the chat <laughs> uh, mentioned, uh, and this is actually true because, uh, and that's why marrying this book was so important. If you ser- if you search Vanu, like there were just a couple few articles on it. Like there was no no information on it whatsoever. So I paid way too much for the book and uh, digitized it. And uh, found all the articles and everything. Vanu is going to be pretty much exclusively on the LUA website. So, <clears throat> so yeah. With that said, I'm joined by uh, my normal co-hosts, uh, Jason and Stan. Well, actually, I guess Jason, you're not nece- necessarily normal yet. This is only your uh, <laughs> second Thursday, third show, I think. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, welcome back. And uh, Stan, Kyle, welcome back uh, to the show. Yeah, I'm still alive. Say, I'm not normal. Yeah, I will. I will say that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yep, indeed, indeed. But uh, yeah, um, as the person in chat said, I spent about thirty bucks on the book, which typically, and that may not seem very much, but like very much. But when I order books, like order like five books on Austrian economics or philosophy, and pay like thirty bucks for all of them. So like, yeah, it was a lot of money for one book for me. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, let's let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. So um, the next chapter is opting out Vanu economics strategies. And uh, some of these chapters are just going to blow through and just kind of mention the highlights. But uh, he lays out tips uh, before attempting to Vanu. Uh, some of his suggestions include Vanu, your home first. Uh, and we'll get more to that here in a moment. Uh, have savings before moving, uh, which would be a nest egg. Earn money by exporting labor at first. Uh, what he was kind of referring to here was rather than um, going just to live out in the woods and trying to make your money by foraging, um, you aren't going to be able to do that until you get more experience. So what he was saying was... Uh, I mean, go back and uh, go back into uh, the servile society, get a contract job, make some money, and then um, go back and live at your your uh, Vanu home base. Um, <clears throat> live frugally, obviously. You've got to live frugally. Um, if you look at that book, and he goes through how much it costs for like each of them to live for a year or six months, that's cheap as shit. Like, it's really cheap. Like yeah, and then, yeah, granted it was back then, but like still, if you imagine like. Uh, I don't know, like three or four hundred bucks, like per person, like for six months now, or even five hundred dollars for six months. Like that's, you got to live frugally. You got to live really, really frugally, um, and stay relatively mobile. Uh, you want to be able to escape the state when they try to uh, come smashing down on your home. So, um, whether that takes the form of an RV, whether that takes form of uh, of uh, <clears throat> heading out uh, on the water, whatever it is, 
go for it. Uh, he also provides uh, information on select- selecting uh, Vanu companions. If you're a woman, you fare very, you fare a lot better than uh, <clears throat> than men. But uh, yeah, nonetheless, and, and and so that kind of concludes that chapter uh, on acquisition of private land. Is the next one, and every time he mentions private land, he puts it in quotations. He doesn't. He's not a fan of private land. He doesn't actually think it exists, and I I, I would you know, tend to agree with him. Uh, he alludes to the fact that there really isn't uh, such a thing uh, when you look at uh, taxation, regulations, etc. Try, try not paying your property taxes and let's see what happens. Um, I guess it's, it's only like advice on, I, I guess, if you need to like uh, get a property. Uh, purchase, uh, he advises people to purchase or lease wasteland. Um, stuff that's not valued at very much, so you keep purchasing price and taxes low. Um, so, Kyle, do you have anything you want to mention uh, right now? Well, I guess this is a debatable point regarding should you buy your own land and so forth, because of course, because as everyone who owns some sort of real estate knows, or even their own home if they managed to pay off the mortgage or didn't bother with the mortgage at all, uh, is the issue of property taxes, and so. You know, if you don't pay the property taxes, or even if you do pay the property taxes, I guess that makes you more vulnerable, I suppose, I think was, was Rayo's thinking. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I guess there's more than one way to skin a cat here. And it's not a decision to make lightly either way, because there are serious ramifications uh, both ways. Um, what I will say is this. I am happy to report that uh, Alex Ansari has his land... And he's actually been clearing it uh, with that Seven saw. And man, dude, I got to swear, when I was watching that video of him, you know, sawing those trees down, he was he was like a kid on Christmas morning. And oh, considering, yeah, he definitely was. And considering all the horse shit he's gone through, not just with Costilla County, but also some other things, you know, I, he, he more than earned it, I think. And so he's really just trying to develop that unimproved uh, lot, uh, you know, really from from the bottom up. So I guess kind of the question is, you know, is to use Alex just as an example, you know, and trying to apply Rayo's ideas to, to Alex, who's actually in the field doing this now, and he has been for over a year now, would Alex be more or less vulnerable than he was a month ago when he was still mobile? That's kind that's, of an interesting question. question. It's a good – well, I mean, he was in, uh, he was in an undisclosed, uh, you know – public land and he was kind of moving around every uh you know week or we can change or whatever the the term the time limit that uh, the bureau of land management has for their what was it two weeks or 10 days or whatever the limit is and I also here, cons- oh, i was just, i was gonna say i know here it's uh it's two weeks because we have um mm-hmm. actually a federal uh forest in uh bloomington indiana and uh uh, you can stay there for two weeks but you you just gotta essentially move to the next campsite so yeah but in order to move um you know presumably you're using an internal combustion engine that runs on petrol so that's interesting so basically that's more of your budget going to big oil Hmm. now does that mean that Alex is again. I asked the question: Is Alex more or less vulnerable uh, today than he was a month ago when he was still mobile? Now that he actually has his own land. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I would. I guess I'd have to. I would have to say this. I mean, when you um, and, and this will lead into this next quote very, very well. Uh, and what what uh, Rayo advised if he was uh, if, if you were going to purchase private land. Um, Obviously, whenever you like t- today, today when you purchase private land, you pretty much have to have like identification. You have to show up, like you have to be there for closing and all that good stuff. Um, so the the recommendations he makes here, I don't think are very applicable. I'll go ahead and read this, and we can keep we can uh, go back to Alex here. Uh, quote: Purchase in the name of someone real or otherwise who has few dealings in the servile society to minimize chances that the land will be confiscated as a result of lawsuits, unpaid income taxes, etc. The owner is preferably a woman, not subject to conscription, not expected to be employed. First, check out the purchase procedure. Is ID required to purchase, to sell? Must purchaser appear anywhere in person? Don't use land as a mailing address, nor as legal home address, on driver's license or other IDs. Don't have a mailbox there. Don't have a telephone there. Maintain these addresses elsewhere. 
Caution everyone who uses land never to mention it as address. Bludgy agencies cross-check each other's records more and more. Get on file with one and others will come asking why you are or aren't doing this and that, end quotes. But, uh, especially that not subject to, to, women aren't subject to conscription. Well, that may change here very, very, very soon. Uh, but yeah, so that's, so that's kind of his advice for purchasing private land, and that's not really applicable to today. Uh, and if someone wants to disagree with me, then feel free. But uh, I've moved... Uh, I've lived in nine states, moved about 10 or 11 times, and uh, been to a couple of the closings. And, yeah, you pretty much have to be there. Like, there's no – got to be there to sign the contract. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think that's 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 necessarily applicable advice uh, for today. But as far as Alex, with the private property, yeah, uh, it makes him less fond of you. Um, rather than just, like, being – like, people not knowing where he is when he just, like, I guess uh, camped out in the National Forest – he was more mm-hmm. Vanu then. Um, and and the, the entire thing, it's on a scale, Vanu versus comfort. You can be more comfortable, but you are less Vanu at that time. Or you can be more Vanu and less comfortable. Um, Alex traded more Vanu for more comfort. So that's, that, that's, that's kind of, I guess, my two cents on it. I guess you, that's one way to view it. But let me postulate something else. And I don't, I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers because we're trying to kind of address something that hasn't been addressed in how many decades? Um, let me try and put it this way. A third option that might seem ridiculous to some, but let's just say it's a good control group, as it were, is vagrancy, right? What if you ditched the RV or whatever the hell, and you were just on foot? You were literally homeless, and you would just be traveling place to place on foot. Now, the question is, is that more or less Vanu? You can't make any claims about comfort because, well, you're homeless now, technically, uh, but now you don't even have uh, the, 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 I guess, less mobility. So I guess that's kind of an interesting question, isn't it? So Yeah, I mean, I, that, that seems similar to um, Rayo's disliking of bikes. Um, like versus a car, like bikes, bikes put you in bludgy territory for longer periods of time. And like if you're if you're just like if you have like a big backpack on, you're walking through a town, uh, I, I would expect some uh, um, police to ask you what you're doing every once in a while. Um, so I, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. That's a good question, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. And think about this too. You know, to, to to kind of um, go back to the boat thing for a moment. I mean, what do boats run on? I mean, I guess unless you're going to go old school and depend on sails and and the wind, literally. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they run on uh, petroleum too, with yeah. their internal combustion engines. And also, correct me if I'm wrong too. Don't don't even the smaller boats even don't they actually consume more oil and gasoline than your run of the mill car on the on them government roads on average? Oh, oh yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. so so maybe maybe to kind of clarify this a little bit more, might I suggest that the choice, the realistic choice, perhaps, is between paying property taxes on the one hand with the private land and and arguably less privacy although I, I guess that's debatable for other reasons because you could always you know you know some of the privacy advocates and maybe even if paper tripping still worked which is an entirely different topic for another time you know you could have you know the corporation buy the land and it would be in the corporation's name and then you would have a representative represent the corporation to buy the private land that might be an interesting option. I know some people have mentioned over the years. I guess that's one way to broach it. But, of course, there would still be the property taxes, and where does that money come from? Yeah, so, yeah that's true. Would you be better off leasing? That, that was that, – that was, um, I mean it's – for him, I think it was the privacy concern. You don't want your name on a house essentially, um, whether it's leasing or buying. Um, I would I would think that he would be more in favor of like renting or leasing than actually, um, I guess, uh, uh, owning the property. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. So. I'm saying like you know if you have a mutual agreement, uh, you know a guy he's got you know five six hundred acres, and you strikes some kind of agreement with him. I know he he did kind of touch on that because once that person knows you there, that is kind of you know that's a little bit of vulnerability, but. Is there is there a conflict between um, squatting on private property as you know from being a libertarian and respecting private property? Um, that's 
That's a good point. Yeah, and I know I, I'm pretty sure he mentioned that he. Well, I, actually, in one of the articles, um, in one of the uh, in, in the article with was it Benjamin Best? I think it was. Um, they part like they 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 put up the um, tent for Ben and, and his woman that was there, uh, like like right on like the border of private and public property, so that if if like the private uh, if the if the owner came on, he could say, well, I meant to p- go on private land. If a um, a uh, national forest bludgie came along and was like, yeah, you're actually on uh, um, public land here, and he'll say, well, I meant to be on this one. I know the owner or, or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, I, I I know what you mean. He wasn't really concerned about that. I don't think. Um, it's not like obviously just don't do any damage to the property. If they don't know you're ever there, then I don't know. That was kind of his thing. Yeah, his arguably, that, so. arguably that would be uh, you know trespassing. But I think that Rayo mentioned about you know that if you can get permission, I think he implied if you can get permission from the private property owner, you should like do so. Duh. And and not only yeah. that, but it would also it's not just for the philosophical reason, but it's also. Uh, a Vanu one of, you know, uh, if the cops come coming around, it's like, yeah, we have permission to be here kind of thing. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, maybe that would account more as a legal interstice, perhaps, uh, especially in terms of like Fourth Amendment reasons. But I will say this. On the one hand, if you're more mobile and you're not a vagrant in the sense of being stereotypically homeless, you would have to be dealing with like a boat, camper, uh, an RV, camper van, something like that. And spending more money on that and and feeding the monster of big oil and that whole fascist business model versus paying prop being stationary in one place and probably more likely not paying property taxes to your uh, provincial government, as it were. Um, I mean, I hate to put it this way, guys, and if you want to disagree, please uh, do so as your conscience dictates. But it almost seems to me like a lesser of two evils uh, dichotomy here. Hmm. If you have to make the choice... Unless you can think of a third option, which I would be all for at this point, because I personally don't want to support big oil and I don't want to support the provincial government of wherever the hell. uh, What are the other options? I mean, I understand the guy's a pioneer. And again, I don't want the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I'm sure there's other things and I'm sure you, Shane, you want to get to. But I I think the issue of, of land ownership, uh, whether it's private land, public land, it's, uh, you try to go into practice, uh, put things into practice, and sometimes you ha- hit uh, the hard limits of reality. I mean, look at the uh, Patriots and their advocacy for, oh, we should return the public lands to the whatever the hell. And it's like, well, that's interesting because that actually, ironically, would negatively affect the full-time RVers who are moving from BLM property to BLM property. And themselves, I guess, there would be less Vanu because of what the Patriots want to do if they ever got their way. So I guess there's more than one way to... To look at things, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, and th- that is a good point. That is a good point. And I mean, um, obviously, technology wasn't where it is today uh, when when Rayo was was, I guess, pioneering these things. And I, I only want to mention this in passing here, and we can I'll address it more in depth when we get to it. But um, like, like obviously, you, you've got to. You, you can't just like automatically like, okay, I'm complete. I'm as invulnerable to coercion as I can be. It's 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 a, it's a process. It's a lifestyle change. Um, so. I mean, like, let's say uh, someone wants to go live on a boat. I mean, they could potentially set up their boat to run off of solar energy, and they'd never have to go back to uh, never have to go back to shore. They can stay in their floating community. But we will get to that here momentarily. Uh, but I do want to, and maybe this isn't the right time for this, but I wanted to go through each section first, and then like just go through the talking points that we thought were important. Um, so I want to play uh, um, the uh, audio file of Epilogue: The Disappearance. Um, it'll give you some more insights. Uh, on that, and you'll actually actually hear the chapter. So, Miss Producer, please cue up clip two. Epilogue. The Disappearance. If you want to get in touch with Rayo after reading the preceding chapters, I'm sorry to say that I can't help you. Rayo disappeared in 1974. I don't even know whether he is now dead or alive. We can only speculate about what might have happened to him. Perhaps one of his underground constructions fell in on him, or maybe he was eaten by a bear. Or he could have abandoned Vanu and returned to a conventional lifestyle. Or maybe he moved overseas. Or perhaps he just decided that he would be freer if he broke off communication and he is still out there in the mountains, living free. If it were anyone else, I would guess that this complete silence over so many years must mean that he is dead. But Rayo is different because his goal always was to become invisible to coercers, meaning mainly government. He might have come to believe that this required that he become invisible to everyone. 
I know of only one tantalizing clue that has a bearing on this mystery. Rayo's last known letter. This is dated February 14, 1974. In it, he writes to his correspondent, quote, My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing, alternate economics, interrelations in general. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all libertarian club involvements. We do not intend to use the libertarian club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates, end quote. Since that time, from or concerning Rayo, no one I know has heard one word or the least rumor. He has completely disappeared. So cryptic. So cryptic. I mean, it makes you wonder, too. It definitely makes you wonder. Like, obviously, like, even if he was still out there in the... Like, even if, uh, I, if I was born earlier, there's no way I could get in contact with him. But now, like, there's definitely no way because, I mean, he's probably been dead for a while. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's intriguing. It's, it's, it's kind of... It's, it's cryptic. It's cryptic. Um, but, yeah, he... Um, there were some, some other articles that, that are available at Liberty Under Attack, and they were kind of implying that, like, he must have found a way to, like, he just kept going deeper and deeper out into the woods until he never had to come back. And uh, that's what pe the people that knew him, um, as was mentioned in the clip, uh, yeah, they, yeah they, they don't think he's dead. I mean, this is, Rayo was a, was a, a new breed at that time. So um, <clears throat> we've got about um, six minutes left or so. Um, any thoughts on that before I uh, move forward to one very, very important part of, of, of Vanya? Let's keep her trucking. Good deal. So, is Vani individualistic uh, or collectivistic? Well, <laughs> the problem with most proposed grand strategies uh, is that they are inherently collectivistic uh, by relying on critical mass in order to achieve uh, either achieve their ultimate goals or perform spe uh, specific actions. Uh, for example, if enough people, if enough of us do X, then we'll be free or we'll have more freedom. Uh, if, if if enough of us move to New Hampshire to the Free State Project, then we'll be free. Uh, things like that. Such populist tendencies uh, ought to be regarded with skepticism, given that you are usually required to place your freedom upon the whims of those who are indifferent. So um, I know Kyle is Kyle's written about it before, um, but yeah, I, I don't like the. Uh, I don't have a, a whole lot of hope in, in, in collective. I actually, I really don't have any hope in, in collectivist movements uh, such as that. Like, like leaderless resistance, as Kyle's written about too. I think that's fantastic. Like, uh, I think that's definitely, definitely fantastic. So, is Vani individualistic or collectivistic? Well, it's individualistic. Um, now, if you look at the book, he'll talk about. Um, um, I think it's in the uh, what, what chapter is it? <clears throat> Well, it's something that's come up. It's something that kind of came up in various different places. Just if I remember correctly, where he's like, "Be very picky and choosy about whom you associate with," and such. Yes. Oh, and oh, that was another article. Maybe we can save that for a different time, where I kind of went into detail about that specifically. But again, Rayo mentioned this decades ago about be very picky and choosy. You know, you are known by the company you keep, so you need to choose yes. your allies wisely. Because you don't want to surround yourself with people who are going to either waste large and inordinate amount of uh, time and effort on your part, or even worse, uh, especially if there's uh, if the ethical enclaves are involved, uh, snitching on you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and here it is because there is okay. So um, this is on actually. I'm not going to say the page because it'll be different in the PDF. It's uh, first page on thoughts on freedom strategy, volume activity, take uh, trade off, and you can find the graph there. The horizontal axis represents amount of activity, also difficulty of concealment. The units are so um, there is there are a couple of possibilities for I guess a collectivistic. Uh, uh, swing on things. Uh, light industry, many products possible, also heavy fabrication for local use, uh, up to several hundred people, and a heavy industry, uh, up to 40,000 people. So there could be a big group. Um, uh, you'll have to look at that to, to get more of a, a more of an understanding of what he's what he's saying. We don't have time to get deep into that, which is why we kind of left it out. But but for the most part, it is definitely individualistic. Um, all, all the stuff that Rayo actually tried was was individualistic, and then um, I mean he, he had a he had a freemate. Um, and then maybe he had some colleagues that he uh, exchanged letters with and things at times, but it's definitely individualistic. Um, and he w he was against uh, those collectivistic movements. So I think that's important to point out here. It is not uh, collectivist. It definitely is not. Yeah, and even when you look at some other collectivistic uh, grand, uh, whatever the hell, even if they're not necessarily re reformist, although many of them are, 
Dare shall I say, you, at some point, you will run up, a, uh, run up against what I've written about elsewhere as disingenuous activists, people who claim to join a uh, whatever the hell, who end up having or other folks discover midstream that there are ulterior motives and other vested special interests involved, not the uh, accomplishing the stated mission and the mission statement or whatever the hell. I mean, hell, Shane, just to use one brief example – uh, look at the, uh, you've written about them, uh, National Liberty Alliance. I mean, look how, uh, I mean, fake registries of, of committees of yep. safety. I mean, my God. I mean, talk about sabotage, sabotage, sabotage. And, you know, so, I mean, here's something for the listeners to consider. Look at any sociopolitical movement of any kind. I don't care what your ideology is. Look at any of them. And seriously, ask yourselves, what have any of them achieved? Pick one. I don't care. Civil rights movement, the envir environmental movement, the fill-in-the-blank, I'm an idiot movement. Seriously, show me some success. No, honestly, show me some successes. Or maybe history shows us some failures. I, I definitely think it I, I definitely think it does. I definitely think it does. You've written extensively about it. I've had my own... As, as you mentioned, I've had my own little uh, run-ins. But, uh, yeah, I think it's it'll come down to, uh, um, again, as you wrote about it, I think it'll come down to leaderless resistance. People, rather than um, putting their putting their hopes into, like, a bunch of people, like, believing the same thing and going towards the same goal, because that's another problem, Kyle, is when a bunch of people get involved in, in one, of these, uh, collect, one of these movements, um, some of them have vested special interests, and some of them um, see that movement as like a way to uh, remedy another grievance or something. It's like uh, like what happened. A means in, uh, to an end, it's a means to an end to something else. You know exactly, and that, and that's one of the major problems with with these collectivist uh, movements is that yeah, there, there are varying goals. Um, if people, I restore the Constitution, I can get my car back, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you've got you've got different goals and different objectives. Now, when it comes to individualistic, uh, such as like Vanu, you you know your goal, you know your goal, and that's what you're there to achieve. And the people that you associate with are on the same path uh, if you do your vetting properly. Yeah. So so there was there was a something brought up in chat. Uh, stateless stateless system will ever be achieved anywhere unless groups of people voluntarily choose to reject it. Is that collectivist? Groups equals larger numbers. Now Rayo spoke to this, and this was in the um, thoughts on freedom strategy utopia section. Um, he thought that um, any like, I guess any I guess belief that um, and, and again I'm speaking from I'm speaking for Rayo here, so yeah, just keep that in mind. I'm trying to. Uh, from his from his book, uh, he he mentioned that any I, I guess any notion of like a uh, completely free society is utopian. Um, now I don't I don't necessarily agree with him. I, I don't. Um, but is that collectivistic? No. I I, I mean, obviously, um, what we've been doing here, Libertarian Attack, is providing solutions. Um, now, obviously, the more people we can get to utilize the free umbrella of direct action, uh, that's great. But rather than um, like uh, like uh, Free State Project New Hampshire, we talk about them a lot because it's just such an it's such an an easy one to bring up. <clears throat> Rather than having everyone move to New Hampshire to, because um, I mean this is what this is what their mission was from the beginning to infiltrate the state and make it more cuddlier. Rather than having everyone um, going for uh, obviously the the goal's the same, but using different strategies to get there. So um, for example. <clears throat> Like, uh, um, I may choose this strategy out of the Freedom of Relative Direct Action. Um, Kyle may choose this one. Stan, Jason might choose this one. Um, Dave may choose this strategy, et cetera, et cetera. But our end goal is still freedom. Um, so I don't know if I explained that very well. Kyle, I'm sure you, you want to chime in on this one. Sure. And actually, sorry, something you said actually sparked a, a thought in me I'd never really considered before. And maybe uh, when, we, when we talk privately later, maybe we can come to a decision about this. But perhaps for the next edition of, of the FUDA, you know, it's interesting, uh, really looking through Vanu and what Rayo really meant by it. I don't think this has been mentioned before, but perhaps the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action actually encourages people to become more Vanu. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you're actually, if you're increasing the level of freedom of, in your own life, isn't that also kind of paralleling becoming less vulnerable to coercion? Yes, yes, it would. Yeah, so whether it's survivalism, whether it's uh, 
um, whether it's uh, agorism, whether it's expatriation, whether it's uh, using et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you are trying to make yourself less vulnerable to coercion. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you utilize the things on, on the Freedom of Real Direct Action, you are um, getting closer to uh, being a Von Nguyen. Yeah. Except, except for the black market. That's a little risky. Oh, but I, I, and I, I, uh, I, I disagree. And that, that was something that came to I was like, do I mention agorism? But yes, you did mention agorism because, yes, you are, you are taking a risk, but ethical enclaves working in the black markets was brought up in, in this book as well. Um, you are taking a risk at getting arrested, but you are becoming less vulnerable by um, circumventing the various regulations, uh, regulations and the taxation, et cetera. Um, so that's a, that's a good point. I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that because I kind of blew over it. Actually, hold on, just to inter interject here. If we go to agorism for a second and the, and the notion of like the five markets, which hopefully the listeners will be familiar with, just because you would be operating or the mainstream Americans would be operating in white market does not therefore mean they are less vulnerable to coercion. In fact, if anything, I think the argument can be made. I think Konkin said something similar. If you're in the white market, you're most vulnerable to coercion. So if there is an argument to be made in favor – Maybe not necessarily black markets, but definitely gray markets, and that is agorist. That gray markets actually arguably could help make you less vulnerable and thus help you become more Vanu if, you're, if we're going to take these different concepts and smash them together and see what sticks. Yes, yeah. and, and there. The, sorry, Jason. There was another concern. This needs to be addressed, like right now. Um, but Vanu sounds like leaving. Rayo disappeared into the woods. Rather than being a uh, witness of liberty, the goal of, is personal freedom, sacrificing the benefits of human development. Um, that's um, as I mentioned in the introduction. Um, the, obviously, Rayo chose to leave, um, but there are there are different ways you can Vanu. You could be. Um, still immersed in that society, you could still write newsletters and magazines and such. Um, again, it's on a scale of Vanu and comfortability. Uh, there, there's no requirement that you have to disappear and move into the woods. That's what I initially thought before I read this book six times. Um, <laughs> but no, that, that's not a requirement at all. You could, you could have a lot of interaction with the servile and state of society. Um, you could um, help people in your local area. Like let's say, let's say uh, uh, Anon 0539 decides to Vanu, he could go and find a spot in the woods and still try to help further the cause of human liberty and just do it on an individual basis. So there's no requirement that you have to disappear and, you know, screw the rest of them. Um, well, but obviously, uh, yeah. obviously you, you can choose to do that, though. You can choose to do that. And I, I, I don't fault anyone for doing that. I mean, sometimes you just get sick of the shit after a while and, and, and you, you get sick of the Libertarian Party doing their ridiculousness. And then you say, screw it. You know, I, 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 I'll be waiting around forever if, uh, um, if I try to wait on them for, for my liberty. So I'm just going to go create it myself. And, and regarding uh, – I think that was a listener's question about uh, disappearance. Uh, how do you explain these celebrity expatriates? You know, these guys that have either been promoted or otherwise uh, featured in the alternative media, whether we're talking about Ken O'Keefe or Doug Casey or probably most importantly in some ways Jeff Berwick, um, have they disappeared? Because last time I checked, they're still giving interviews. They're still doing stuff. I think Anarcho Polko had its other event somewhat recently. So have mm -hmm. those guys disappeared because they've expatriated? I mean, so I guess there's a more a more fundamental question. How is disappearance being defined here? I mean, hell, if we were having a separate discussion about paper tripping, would that count as as disappearing too? Because last time I checked, that's only more of a, that, to be fair, that is more of a legal interstice, as, as Rayo would put it. But how is disappearance being defined here? Now, last time I checked, the term vanu meant voluntary, as an awkward contraction of voluntary, not vulnerable. So it's about there's the voluntariness and then there's the vulnerability. And the emphasis was on not just pushing and, and, and trying to create a world, this grand utopia of an absence of coercion, as some people would derisively describe it, but rather in your own life becoming invulnerable to coercion as much as possible. So <laughs> I, I, yeah. I got to say, I mean, how is disappearance being defined here? Yeah, you know, that, 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 hell, that, that look at the political it. prisoners. And sorry, one other thing. Look at the political prisoners. 
have they, I, I mean, if anybody's disappeared, I think they have. I mean, nobody gives a crap about them except, of course, for <laughs> the select few people. And you know who I'm talking about, Shane, who actually like go through the court documents and such. So how, how, what is disappearance being defined here as? Last time I checked, unless we're talking about political prisoners or people at Gitmo or people that have been extraordinarily rendition and tortured, I don't really know anybody or can think, conceive anybody who's actually truly disappeared off the face of the planet. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. And, and see that like this is such like this. There's such a wide uh, range of opportunity here. Like, again, voluntary and not vulnerable. That's that's all Vanu is. Um, and that's why Rayo touched upon a bunch of different things. And he, he didn't just like now well, he could have. He could have just went and pursued these things and not wrote about anything and Cotton's just said screw it all. But um, for a while, like, yeah, he, he definitely tried for, oh, I don't know, 15 years at least uh, publishing this information uh, and trying to get it out there. I mean, yeah, it, it is definitely uh, kind of on the fringe. But there's there's a wide range of possibilities for what you can do as as, as Vani. You could you could still very much be a, 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 in the Surf Island State of Society um, or you could go disappear in the woods. I mean, there's there's a lot of different options here. There's no set. All Vanu is is voluntary and not vulnerable. It doesn't lay down a stringent. It's not like it's not like agorism where it lays down these stringent um, guidelines. Um, and Ray also mentioned this is important too. Uh, what was Vanu 50 years ago may not be Vanu today, and what what um, is Vanu today may not be Vanu 100 years from now. So it, it changes with the political climate, your situation, um, your lifestyle, all of those things. So it's very very much um, dependent on on your goals as an individual. Not only that, but I think there was an entire article slash chapter that was called Vanu in Cities. So again, to the listener who may be hearing this for the first time, uh, you know, what do you mean by disappearance? I mean, can you really be said to disappear in a city? I mean, unless you're a vagrant, I suppose, but that's, I don't think that's what we're talking about here. And the the listener uh, defined, uh, um, yeah, Kyle's not watching the chat. I apologize. I should have mentioned that. But um, yeah, dis- like uh, di- disappearing, uh, voluntary opted out of human contact. So um, that was what the the listener was going off. I think we I think we addressed that. And uh, I think um, Miss Producer, I think we will go over. We'll go we'll go into overdrive because um, uh, we've still got a lot. And I want to get through all of this analysis today because next Thursday we're going to be going into another uh, aspect of Vani. So um, security culture. Um, Kyle, uh, I know you've been working on this, uh, working on this book. Uh, how would you define security culture? Security culture is the direct application of the right to privacy. So if you don't value the right to privacy, or if you are unfortunately like most constitutionalists I come across, thankfully not all, uh, they'll say things like, uh, well, if I don't, if you don't have anything to hide, you have nothing to fear. Uh, and it's like, wow, really? Uh, what about that Fourth Amendment you guys claim to value with your legal interstices? Oh, smack down. A little bit of hypocrisy there. Uh, but that's unfortunately where things have gone, especially with, you know, the Donald and the fake Muslim invasion, a couple other topics that would be better to address at another time, which is why it's important to have integrity, as Sam Conkin described it, so you don't contradict yourself all the time. Yeah, so the right to privacy is kind of important because, like you were mentioning earlier, Rayo didn't want to put his uh, legal name on, you know, title deeds and and, and whatever else. And that also kind of uh, helps with the mobility. And I think the only, I guess you could say, legal interstice was really with the, I think it was his his, uh, van, his RV, uh, in terms of maintaining, like, the driver's licensure and things more related to that. But other than that, like, that, that was pretty much, at least from what he wrote about, wasn't really much of anything else. And it was interesting, too, other parts in the book where he was mentioning about corresponding with people. And, yes, yeah. there was the element, like mentioned, like I mentioned earlier, about, you know, choosing your, your associates carefully. But more specifically about, like, using P.O. boxes and, and such, almost kind of like... And using drop points, too. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, uh, the older paper tripping books uh, mention about mail drops. Because remember, there there was no internet, or maybe I should uh, <laughs> couch that a little bit. It was things more like ARPANET uh, and such. Depending which specific decade we're talking about here. But the point is that it's not the internet as it is today with the World Wide Web. Not even close. So yeah, mail drops were a lot more important in terms of having lines of communication in some way or another. I mean, imagine. A world without cell phones. Oh, my goodness. 
never mind smartphones and you know the more later developments. So yeah, in terms of security culture, it looks like Rayo really was for his time period really exercising it as as much as possible, but it was interesting what he did was a much more comprehensive application of it. He wasn't just doing this particular technique in isolation and then another particular technique in isolation or sometimes maybe combining two or three techniques. He made it he really took security culture and made it into a lifestyle, which yes. was rather interesting too. So he was using different security culture techniques, technologically appropriate to his time period, and did it in such a way to make to, to, to increase his invulnerability to coercion, which is absolutely fascinating. And I guess in a roundabout way, I, I didn't really think about this before, and maybe I'll mention this in, in the book when it comes out, hopefully soon, is uh, that in a lot of ways, security culture, if you decide, you know, people decide to really take all the different techniques I write about and put them all together, whether they intend to or not, they're becoming more Vanu, actually. Yeah, yeah, they definitely are. I think it's also it's also worth mentioning. We'll get more into this. This will be um, next Thursday's broadcast. We'll be comparing because um, there are a lot of different things incorporated into into the Vanu strategy. Uh, security culture being one of those. But uh, those who practice Vanu must practice security culture, as Rayo did himself. But not all those who practice security culture um, must be or are Vanuans. So um, that's that's worth mentioning. And uh, yeah, obviously, invisibility to authority is a component of Vanu. Um, I want to move forward here to the legality and efficacy of Vanu because we've only got about 12 minutes left. And as I said, Mr. Producer, we're, we're going to go a bit over. I want to cover all this right now because it's a good conversation so far. Um, so um, I guess the, the question to ask is, is, is Vanu illegal? And there are different facets. Obviously, you talked about RV living, living on the water, camping in the woods, uh, Vanu in cities. Um, I think that's yeah, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, there are a bunch of different strategies to utilize. So let's first, Kyle, uh, Jason, and Stan, talk about RV living. Um, now, like as I stated, uh, Rayo was a van dweller like at the beginning, um, and obviously that requires freedom permits. <laughs> you got to make mm-hmm. sure all your all your paper your, all your uh, your papers are up to up to date, and uh, obviously there it, it depends on where you park as well uh, in your RV, um, whether it's a yes or a no. Uh, but for information, for information on, on RV living specifically, check out uh, the interview you did with Alex Ansari. He did it for over a year, uh, and that interview is on May 8, 2016. So if you go to fprnradio.com forward slash Liberty Under Attack, just go to May 8th of 2016. You can find that interview. Check it out. Enjoy. Um, but Kyle, any thoughts on RV living uh, or anyone else? Feel free, feel free to step in, guys. This isn't an interview. Kyle's at Kess Coast tonight, so you guys can step in and tell him to shut up if you want to. That would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Kyle, shut up. Hey, no, I – my parents actually own an RV, and uh, they can tend to be pretty expensive, depending on the size you get. But uh, you know, just with the fuel it takes them to, to to move them, the upkeep, as far as you know, things aren't built, you know, the same way as they are in an actual brick and mortar home. So, I mean, the RV. I can't remember if it was uh, it was yeah, it was Danny that was talking about you know why not just do it out of a tent. You know, our RV, our being is, is wow. It's expensive. Yeah, and and I, and I guess I should have clarified that. Like, uh, he was he lived in like a more of like a camper van. Like, it wasn't like a full size RV or anything like that. Um, but yeah, like that would not be Vanu at all. Like, the the bigger your van is, the more like it, the harder it is to get off of the road and be inconspicuous. So, um, yeah, more more like a more like a camper van um, is is what he would recommend. He would be very very much against. Uh, getting like uh, I don't know a forty foot uh, diesel pusher. <laughs> yes, yes, he would not advise that. Yeah. Neither would I. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, if the damn thing is a bus, I mean, just just fucking forget it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, one thing I did see that probably would work for the situation, though the price might blow it out of most people's proportions, is. You know, there was a company for a while that would pretty much take, like, you know, the industrial vans that you'd see, like, you know, plumbers buy, you know, those uh, E-150s or whatever they are is the Ford version, whatever the Chevy or Dodge version is. And they'd pretty much put a lift kit on them, put, you know, some more grippier tires on them, pretty much lift them, pretty much do the same thing you would a truck, and then they'd pretty much rig out the back with a 
you know, all the amenities you'd see in a smaller camper. You know, that's an option. But yeah, I kind of agree. Some of the, a lot of the campers out there, I just caution people, are mainly meant for the guy who isn't going to take it off road, you know? You can't yeah, that, buy that's, a pop-up. That's, where, that's a requirement for volume. Yeah, you're, you're going to have to go yeah. off road. <laughs> yeah, you can't buy, you know, your average pop up and expect to drag it through, you know, some pretty nasty off road shit. You know, you're just going to tear it up and it's going to just be a hindrance. And it's, that's what you're not going to want. You're not going to want something that's a hindrance. It's for the weekend warrior. Right. That's exactly what it <laughs> yes, is. Yes, that, yeah, that's a good way to put it's it. It's the guy who's like driving it behind a minivan, whipping it down the freeway. You know, kids screaming in the back. The guy looks like he's about to have a hemorrhage and, you know, well, driving pulls up into a public campground. Right. Pulls up to a public campground, hardly can back it up, against the back <laughs> of his his minivan because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing <laughs> you know pull the kids bikes off the kids zoom off and then like he relaxes for a little bit you know on the weekend that's what it is you know before you yeah. become a, a servant for the rest of the family yeah <laughs> or you know he enjoys a few days off before he has to pack all that shit up sunday go back to his job monday and is back to wanting to put a pistol in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially, essentially. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good way of putting it. But I want to move on to uh, living on the water. Cause like I said, this is the most attractive to me. Like, just yeah, I don't know. There there are a lot of uh, a lot of facets to this. Uh, now with the legality, uh, Kyle, do you want to speak to the uh, international waters? Yeah, sure. Uh, and then there's one other thought I wouldn't want to offer on the boats as well regarding legality. Well, this is rather interesting, right? So as opposed to RV living and dealing with the government roads and the bludgies and, and such, there is such a thing as international waters. And the so and, and what would properly be understood as Admiralty Maritime Jurisdiction, not the fakey sovereign citizen nonsense, but actual Admiralty Maritime and such, where the short version is that basically once you're outside the coastal uh, areas of a – uh, uh, of a government's coastline, and it varies. Sometimes it can be anywhere from five miles out from the shore out to the water, uh, five miles out, ten miles out. Whatever the range is doesn't really particularly matter. But once you get past that arbitrary uh, limit that's already de- out in the deep water, then you're in international waters. And so That kind of is interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. One is that um, Rayo was mentioning about how some kind of amorphous temporary, uh, for lack of a better term, communities of different boaters could kind of dock together in the middle of, I don't know, the Atlantic or Pacific or even the Indian Ocean uh, and, you know, trade or do whatever. And then if they need to scatter or whatever, they they can do that. Um, You know, it's also interesting, too, because... You know, there have been concerns over the centuries regarding activities like piracy, which, you know, is like, well, wait a minute. If there is no government, if if the international waters are a no man's land, then how do you deal with issues of criminal justice? Not only with criminal justice, but how also do governments deal with the issue of war, specifically naval warfare, or perhaps more to the point, preventing the onset of war if, say, a hostile uh, government's navy were conducting military exercises a little too close. <laughs> Russians! Um, you know, that's kind of, that, that, that's, that's kind of interesting, right? Uh, like, how do you deal with all of that? And I think what Rayo was kind of, as far as the legal interstices go, I think what he was inadvertently relying on is the fact that because it is a no-man's land, uh, that hopefully the international treaties between some governments would kind of make a lot of coercion kind of immaterial, right? I mean, they can't tax people who live on the water. There is no property yeah. tax on water, for example. So there's, I, I mean, 
there's that at the very least. Um, there's also one other thing I want to mention briefly. There is kind of more of a, uh, of a more uh, mechanical or engineering issue. And to bring Alex into this one more time, you know, he was mentioning in a recent video of his, his, his RVs having a different problem, not the transmission issue, which was something a while back that uh, earlier this year that he managed to get repaired. Now it's the radiator. And I was just thinking, like, Alex is not a mechanic at all. He actually has to pay other people to do that for him. And I don't want to get into the economic issues because that's not what I want to emphasize here. What I want to emphasize here is imagine if Alex was instead in a hypothetical parallel universe, more or less in a somewhat similar situation, minus the land, of course, uh, but in a boat. So how would he Mm. call up the mechanics to fix the boat if he was in, let's say, mm, 50 miles, 100 miles out of outside, let's say, Malaysia. How would that work exactly? So that would kind of suggest that maybe if you're going to be RV living and double and triple and quadruple if you're going to be living on the water, maybe you should be like a competent mechanic or maybe bring (laughs) one or maybe if you have a free mate, you know, have one with you. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree that that'd be that'd be a bad that'd be a bad problem if uh, you get out uh, as you said fifty a hundred miles out and your your motor stops working or something and you're like well shit now I'm stuck out here can't paddle this big thing back uh, but, uh, but yeah that, that's definitely a good point um, there are also I, I guess obviously um, like like for an individual or a couple of boats or something um, I mean yeah like a floating community would be would be would be awesome like you you'd have uh, um, I guess in this hypothetical uh, um, floating comedian. You'd have your, you'd have your doctor. You'd have your mechanic. You'd have, uh, you'd have your et cetera, et cetera. You, uh, you I, I guess, ideally, you would. And uh, uh, this is one thing I was kind of, uh, one thing I was kind of thinking about. Obviously, if if you're trying to go Vani, like you want to make le- le- like less and less trips back to the Cerebral Society because uh, the more self self sufficient you can be, obviously, the better off you are. Um, but additionally, as Rio kind of mentioned, like they despise going back into the survival society like it it was not good for them mentally uh like they they just hated it so much that they just they wanted to go there less and less and less until i guess they never did again or they might have i i, I don't know but um so so obviously like when you when you when you go out there the first time you, your goal would be you, you try to go back a couple few times a year that wouldn't raise any suspicion but um obviously the end goal would be to not have to return at all and this is like obviously my mind was going a lot when i was preparing for this show like um I don't know. Like there are a lot of options. Like you, you find an island somewhere uh, that hopefully um, there's no one there, an island with with nobody on it. Yeah, you, you kind of get your boat out there, and you have a couple like floating pontoons or something that could act as your gardens, or you plant stuff on on the island. What, whatever it is, but like there's so many so many options. This is like this one's more. You, you don't really have to worry about government on an island. Uh, so. I don't know. There, there's a lot of options here. I think it's definitely possible. And I was, I was kind of alluding to earlier. I mean, yeah, you, you could put solar panels on your boat. Like, there's so much that you can do. I think this is probably the. Um, I think this is like the most. This is the most attractive. To me, I don't know if it's the most efficacious, but uh, definitely the most attractive. Well, I guess maybe the. I mean, just to go with the hypothetical a little bit. I mean, maybe the worst you would have to worry about is let's just say like the U.S. Navy trying to enforce their version of property rights by saying that oh. Oh, you think you're gonna salvage the blah 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 from the bottom of the ocean at this one shallow point? Uh uh-uh, uh, our United States Code, and according to the Admiralty Law section of it, says something else or whatever that you can't get that old part from the Titanic or some other boat that, you know, whatever the hell. I mean, I guess maybe that would be the worst of it if you don't count piracy. But again, the, but again, the pirates are street crimin- well, I was gonna say street criminals, but there's no street, right? Uh, but they're like the street criminal. Okay, it's organized crime. Or actually, if you look at a lot of pirates, especially, well, some of them would be the Somalis, but there's other ones too. Uh, can you really say they're all that organized? And where did they get their RPGs from? Because I thought a lot of them were poor. <coughs> Military industrial complex. So, you know, there's there, there's a lot of other things kind of going on. And so, yeah, I mean, if you can find some, like, uncharted... Uh, islands where you could maybe farm a little bit or something. I mean, I guess that could always work. Remember, too, the weather on uh, on the oceans can get quite tumultuous at times. And, you know, for people who might feel a little seasick, you know, they might want to consider, you know, paddling back to land. 
Yeah, that, that that's true. That that's another aspect. That's another aspect of it. Uh, like uh, there are a lot of islands that are there sometimes, and some that aren't. So you want to make sure you, you 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 do your research and you find an island that's been there for for quite a while uh, and doesn't get uh, I guess um, yeah, just completely uh, underwater. Wouldn't be good if you have your, your garden there and such. I don't think the, I don't think it could survive that. Uh, but but yeah, let's move on to uh, camping in the woods. We kind of already discussed this uh, public versus private land. Uh, and Jason actually mentioned this, which is good. You can squat on public land for, for around two weeks. I would say in most areas, uh, in most areas. So um, that kind of covers the legality for, for camping in, in the middle of the woods. Um, now, if you are going far out in like a, a national forest or something and uh, you're there, like that's where your home is, like you're, you're Rayo and you're out there all the time. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I would say that's, a, that's illegal. And there's actually one article that I posted um, and a sheriff uh, was, uh, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this probably badly, but you can go to Liberty Intertech to find it. I think it was the Mystery Man of the Libertarian Movement was the title of the article. But uh, a sheriff uh, uh, was going, he, he wanted to trade in his car or his, uh, his cruiser for a four-wheeled vehicle. And he, he said something along the lines of, uh, uh, yeah, there's people deep out there in the woods and we don't know what they're doing. Um, so I guess the, the, they they were aware of that back, I think that was in 1987. So like I yeah, there, there are people that, that that stay out there permanently, but they don't have the resources, the time to actually go and, and get these people off. And there's also the thing that Rayo mentioned a couple of times. Um, if uh, if the if the uh, bludgies come out there, uh, they could just set the entire woods on fire, which uh, that's not what they want because uh, uh, the state makes a lot of money uh, off of timbering those public lands. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You guys have anything else to mention there? Yeah, just one thing real briefly. Um if you look at, like, the off-grid homesteaders today, you know, in a lot of ways, even if they are living on their own land, as, as Alex is doing now, but even if they've been doing it, like, for years and they've got, like, their crops and they got their bunker and they've got, I mean, whatever the hell, right? And it's, like, more or less fully developed. Uh, they're self-sufficient farm, as it were. Uh, isn't that more Vanu than living in the, these blasted cities? Definitely, yeah. I mean, Definitely. I mean, kind of like, kind of like I was joking at at the very beginning of the broadcast. I mean, being in a city fucking sucks. I mean, there's so much crime and violence and, and dirt and smog and just a bad physical environment overall. Never mind the public schools and pick your twenty thousand different grievances. But if you get out to rural areas, then you know automatically you're more Vanu. So, like, unless you're going to do the whole vanoing in cities thing, which does involve some degree of preparation and arguably capital investment, uh, you know, in some ways it might be have a cheaper capital investment to, to go into, I mean, hell, maybe even the suburban areas even might in some areas might be somewhat better, especially if there's, like, unimproved lots uh, in, in some of the <laughs> corners of, like, a suburban development. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's definitely an inter interesting uh, interesting point as well. But yeah, if, if you're if you're rural, you're definitely more Vanu. Um, obviously, to be to Vanu, you have to be uh, actually conscious of what you're doing and trying to escape the state. But uh, but yeah, uh, very very good points. Uh, Jason, Stan, uh, any, anything uh, that you want to hop in with? No, I'm good. Let's keep rolling. I know right, you got a lot roll. to get through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You hopefully, some truck, to another. motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully this doesn't turn into it like I don't think it will, but a three-hour uh, Gary Hunt extravaganza. But uh, uh, Vanu in cities, this is this is an interesting one. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about about uh, your your Vanu home, your your home base. Uh, Rayo um, advises that like you you kind of have to do your 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 home base first. That's where you spend most of your time, whether it be uh, uh, um, uh, procreating or uh, um, imbibing or reading or um, anything like that. You spend most of your time in your house. Uh, so that's the first place that you want to Vanu. Um, for them, it was part, part time in their RV and part time living out in the woods. Uh, but you want to make sure you have that place that's, uh, that's, that's mostly invulnerable to coercion. Uh, that's, that, that's where you start. Uh, and Vanu shelter is a prerequisite, prerequisite to uh, Vanu trade. Um, now Vanu shelter would be like an underground home, an apartment, uh, living out in the woods, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, but, uh, Kyle, you mentioned something really, really interesting when you were talking, uh, when we were preparing for this broadcast, uh, an interesting idea regarding industrial parks. Uh, and, and again, again, I'll repeat this, uh, it, Vani leads to more Vani. So why don't you tell listeners a little about that? Well, if you think about it, 
I think what Rayo was kind of implying with the examples that he was using was the impression I got was like doing something like a historical part of town, like in the basement somewhere. But then it's like, okay, even if you were to, first of all, it would be almost impossible to create a basement underneath a pre-existing building without attracting a lot of attention. But even if you were to buy a building, which would also be kind of expensive to some degree, uh, to, to like renovate the place without people seeing and all that. So even the process of, of creating the shelter also has to be pretty vanu as well. And then it kind of, when I was reading that, it kind of sparked an idea in me. I'm like, what about industrial parks as an alternative? Because if you think about it, especially in certain t- in the types of buildings, which usually tend to be kind of, um, they can range, but the what I'm imagining are like, the, not ranch style, but like long and flat, where it's not, we're not talking skyscrapers here, but they do take up a lot of ground space. Well, some designs of buildings I've seen in certain industrial parks, at least here in Texas, where there'll be... Uh, a lot of like a glass exterior uh, where you can actually look in from uh, at least from the second floor up. But then there'll be like interior space that'll actually have like different rooms and, and uh, like subdivided parts and therefore that actually are completely hidden from view. So, for example, if you were in your car and you're driving through an industrial park and in, in, in some areas I've seen, you would only see uh, these kind of uh, gla- maybe I'm not describing this well. But like the like starting from the second floor up, these glass bill, uh, <laughs> walls essentially. But you wouldn't see anything in like the interior of the building uh, that would be kind of cordoned off, as it were. So if, what I'm trying to say is that a Vanu shelter could be in the interior portion of like one. Well, it doesn't no. <laughs> there's no law that says it has to be one limited to one floor. You could also have like an internal staircase too. Or an elevator, maybe, if you want to go that far, where you would be completely hidden from view. And in fact, you could actually have whatever would be seen through the windows to be filled maybe with some superfluous furniture or other things that, dare shall I say, gives it a degree of camouflage that, oh, it's just an office building. Yeah, yeah, and you could could even, too... um... You could even like in this industrial park. You, you like you could have like uh, um, obviously not and uh, and one of your names uh, or I guess you try not to get your name involved in it. But you could have like uh, um, like uh, and I know um, some some drug dealers will do this. They'll put like they'll create a fake business like they're, where they're profiting off of it. You a could, shell corporation. You, yes, yeah. you could create a shell corporation of sorts like where it's like oh yeah this is uh, oh I don't know like uh, um, Acme Company. Don, Don, yeah, Don's textiles or something and like you actually have like a bustling business there and then everything else that's vanu is just underground like there's so many ways that this could actually like uh that this could actually come into fruition it's not even funny like that and that's that's what's fun about vanu it's open to your creativity uh (laughs) (laughs) yeah and the funny part too is that industrial parks um i'm not I, i guess i would have to check on the on the zoning just for just for more curiosity sake sake regarding you know legal interstices but um you know, uh, they are, if I remember correctly, uh, industrial parks are zoned for commercial uses. So if your business happens to be <laughs> an ethical enclave, I think the uh, I think the answer kind of speaks for itself. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think you posed this question when we were, when we were preparing. Uh, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but would a Vani shelter be the same uh, as, as a hideout? Um <clears throat> And I, I would say that it could be both, or they could remain separate. And I remember in, in the conversation we were having, Kyle, um, have have like a couple of the like a, have an industrial park. Uh, you could have a couple industrial parks. You could have a historic like a historical building. No, no, limit yourself by any means. You could have two of those on like the west coast of the United States, like uh, uh, one of the uh, Pacific uh, Pacific uh, cities. Uh, yeah, one of the Pacific cities. You could have uh, like a Vanu home in the Bahamas. You could have like a boat so you can just go float out there in the water and um, be self-sufficient in that manner. Like there's so many things that you could do. But uh, yeah, as far as a Vanu shelter being the same as a hideout, I mean, why limit yourself? Like <laughs> multiple multiple places you can go to. Mobility. Mobility is important as Rayo, uh, Rayo mentioned multiple, multiple times. Yeah, and and remember too, uh, you know, if if people's concern are like, you know, the jackbooted bludgies, you know, bargaining in at three a.m. or whatever, well, that's kind of interesting too. If you happen to live in multiple places, and I guess this is kind of in this. I'm sorry, I just thought of this. This is kind of in the spirit of the perpetual travelers, where they've got like multiple different places where they operate. 
depending on what specific function we're talking about. Like one place would be for tax purposes, another place would be for employment purposes, another one's for purposes of so-called legal residence and, you know, yada, yada, yada. I guess Vanu in some ways really was pioneering perpetual traveler before the term perpetual traveler was coined, if I remember my history right. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And and obviously, yeah, there is a, there obviously is a concern all the time um, obviously, like the the state likes to uh, um, likes to kill, murder, and steal. So uh, there obviously is that concern. But if you have like three houses, and you may only go back to, uh, I don't know, like uh, one of them is your one of those is like your Vanu home. You'll stay there for a month or something, just a random month out of the year. Like unless they stake out like the place, like that place or the two place you have in the United States. That, well, let's say uh, they have to like pretty much put like put forth twenty four seven surveillance, uh, and and I would say more often than not. Uh, you're probably good. One one thing I would like to add briefly, some people, met, some of the listeners might be curious if we're talking about like multiple homes or multiple apartments or multiple shelters or multiple whatever the hell, uh, how are you going to pay for all that? Well, uh, if people would like to refer to that, um, uh, and maybe Shane, you can help me out with this, but that earlier episode of the Direct Action Series regarding financially independent early retirement, I think that uh, can kind of uh, kind of try to answer that question in terms of how can this be affordable? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and yeah, that was uh, January seventeenth with uh, Jake DeSillis. And uh, again, hopefully, we'll get Pete Cisco on because uh, he's got a lot of uh, how to make money on the internet would be the subject of that interview. Uh, you got a little sneak peek there. It's not booked though, so you might not get to hear it. But I hope you do. Um, but yeah, that would be another another aspect there. I mean, the per- perpetual travelers already do that. I mean, um, they're they're uh, they make their money on the internet, so they don't have to worry about uh, uh, any actual like nine to five job or anything of that nature. They can do their work. Uh, this is what's like, kind of envious for me as I, I'm on uh, Pete Cisco's email list. He's like, "Hi, I hope you guys are doing well today. I'm sitting on a beach working." And it's like, "Fuck you, dude. Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, good for him. I, I I like to be in that position at some point. But uh, so yeah, that that's uh, there's a lot of ways you can make money. There definitely are, especially with the advent of the internet. So um, there's also, and you kind of mentioned this. Uh, you you mentioned this uh, previously, Kyle. So we'll just kind of uh, cover this in passing. Uh, paper tripping. Uh, Rayo did appear to be in. Uh, he, he didn't actually. He didn't give his explicit like consent or advocation for fake uh, uh, legal identification, but um, especially in like the RV living party, is like you, you need to have identification whether it's faked or not. Like it, that's just he said that a, a few times, faked or not. So he didn't say it has to be fake, but uh, you want to cut down on your ties to the state as much as possible. But uh, if you're gonna have mobility uh, via a, an RV, uh, you're you're gonna have to at least. Uh, either get the identification or appear to have the identification. So um, that kind of wraps up, um, I guess, the, the talking points. And now we're kind of on to the conclusion part. Um, Jason, Stan, uh, what do you guys think so far? Do you, you, you have any thoughts? I'm getting, ready to go. I'm getting ready to call my job and just quit and fucking take it to the road, man. I've had enough <laughs> of this shit. <laughs> I'm out of here, guys. Dude, it was a great show. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you've got work tonight too. That, uh, yeah, so that's gonna be fun after after hearing this discussion. Um, yeah, stuck, but uh, <laughs> stuck there for eight nine hours or whatever. Yeah, Stan, what, what about you, man? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think you know all these ideas are really great. I mean, you know, we all try to diverge ourselves as much as possible from the uh, the uh, powers that be, as it were. And, you know, reading this, it kind of gives you ideas, as it were. Some of these you might not be comfortable with. Some of these you might not be comfortable with yet. But I think, you know, it's important for everyone to go through this and kind of be like, okay, I'm comfortable with this. I'm not quite comfortable with this yet. So I'm going to stay back. You know, I still like my internet, so I'm not willing to be out in the middle of nowhere where there's no internet. Um, but, you know, it's an evolution, you know. I think for Rayo, it was the same exact thing, you know. He kind of walked into this. He didn't just go full sprint, you know, into this. I think people who do that are just going to find out they just run into a glass wall, you know, just yeah. smack down, 
you know. And yeah. bit off more than they could, more than they could chew. Yeah, yeah, you bite off more than you can chew. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, it gave me a lot of cool ideas where I'm like, yeah, I could probably do that. And there's items where I'm like, I might not ever be able to be you know, completely be comfortable of you know this but it's like you know it's a case by case basis you have to determine how what you're willing to sacrifice in order for your freedom indeed de- definitely definitely and 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 and, and obviously we, we haven't we haven't uh uh uh, given any uh, any portrayal that that these are still uh, uh, efficacious, that they're that they're still viable in, in today's society, uh, we've, we've actually uh, explicitly a couple of times said that a lot of this stuff may not be possible. Um, but w- but what's what's very valuable about this book is it lays out so many of these ideas where people can uh, create their own freedom right now, and. I mean, a couple of these I never heard of, like the Sovereign Free Isles, which we didn't touch on here, but they're in the book. Uh, the the Sovereign Free Isles, just like all of this stuff, like it's their potential solutions to uh, um, the the tyranny that that, that we uh, that we uh, collectively face, unfortunately. Uh, so that that's definitely what's valuable about Vaughn. We have we have a lot more stuff to work from now, and even if. Uh, um, like let's say vomiting in cities isn't necessarily possible. There's still aspects of it we can implement and, and, and use and, and, and trying to uh, uh, regain our freedom. So any other thoughts before, uh, before we, uh, I guess, uh, provide our concluding thoughts uh, for, uh, uh, for the show? I say let's conclude. All right, so let's conclude. So um, important question to ask, is anyone else vomiting? Well... Uh, there's no way to know uh, unless they make themselves public, uh, as we as we mentioned multiple times before. I mean, yeah, Vonnevins practice security culture, and uh, Ray was laying down the theory in practice. Uh, much like uh, Sam Conkin, uh, he had to be out front and public to, to to I guess lay the foundation for his uh, philosophy and strategy um, to get people to actually start doing it. So Rayo had to do much of the same thing. Uh, if he wanted it to grow, he had to be at least be public at to some extent. Um, so, uh, and, and here's another interesting point: uh, the fate of Rayo is this is the stuff of legend, mythology, and fairy tale. Uh, Benjamin Best, the article that's mirrored on the Liberty Under Attack website, uh, uh, he was last known to uh, Benjamin Best. Uh, the letter that is in the uh, I guess the anthology, the book "Finding the Search for Personal Freedom," was a letter to Benjamin Best. That was the last correspondence that Rayo had with the uh, servile statist society or public at all. So and and we did cross we did cross reference that so, um, yeah, Kyle, what do you what, what do you have so far? I think in a lot of ways, Vanu was kind of the precursor to the Fuda, right? I mean, because look at what Rayo was doing. He was kind of going down the list of okay, what are all the options that are available to me to try and win back my own freedom. And yeah, he did make it a little bit more specific in terms of trying to address the uh, the vulnerability question. But in a lot of ways, the FUDA that, that you and I, Shane, have kind of put together is in many ways kind of exploring, like, what are the option available? What are the options available to all of us in order to increase our own freedom, you know, as much as possible? And so uh, I, I guess in some ways, uh, history repeating itself is not necessarily a bad thing especially considering that there are certain options that are available to us that were not available to him. Indeed, definitely, definitely. Um, and then I do have a note in here uh, for another article, which uh, I'll go, yeah, I'll schedule that post for tomorrow morning. So that'll, that'll be out tomorrow morning uh, on the Liberty Under Attack website. But there's an article Kyle directed me to called uh, 13 Steps to a Life of Freedom. It was published in 2002. I don't remember the author's name, but uh, she was actually, uh, I guess you could call her a van nomad, her and her uh, husband, I think it was, or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, that article will be published, uh, just another, I guess, someone else out there doing it. Uh, that you can kind of uh, maybe get some information for uh, whatever you're, you're trying to do to free yourself. This also brings up the importance of archiving, as I kind of mentioned before. Uh, this book, uh, I guess it almost kind of went down the memory hole. There are only a few, a handful of copies on, on Amazon. Um, it's obviously not published anymore. Limb Panics Unlimited was uh, per- was bought out, and only a certain number of books were taken to the new uh, the new publisher. Vanu not being named on as one of them, <clears throat> which is why there's no copyright concern. But um, yeah, the importance of archiving. Um, 
and if if you read the book, you, you saw there were a lot of uh, like Zarenyi and Straken uh, and a couple of other people mentioned. I have scoured Google for articles by them. I'm trying to dig through all this history as that I can find, and they're just not available. They're not available. Um, so there, hence again the importance of archiving. If uh, anything historical like that is, is worth digitizing so it can be uh, made available to for generations to come and even better on multiple websites. So if you have a website and you want to archive uh, uh, the book, uh, you want to archive all of those articles that I mirrored, uh, please do it. Make, them, make sure they don't fall down the memory hole. And one, one thing I want to add on to that about the importance of digitizing certain books and all that is that it's not just the digital file that's important necessarily, but it's the fact that you can use the digital file to then physically print hard copies um, in manuscript form, yes, on an eight, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, sure, but you can actually print out multiple copies and like give it to people. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, I, I I definitely agree, and I, I mean, and, and yeah, that that is a possible. That is, I, I mean, you just kind of sparked an idea in me. Um, I don't know, I don't know, like uh, maybe actually re reprinting uh, Vani the Search for Personal Freedom. Uh, I don't know, it might be possible. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that uh, later on. But uh, yeah, just get it out there, uh, get it out there uh, in print format uh, rather than uh, digital format uh, for people that want a hard copy of it. But uh, yeah, so the importance of archiving. I guess the one, the the last couple of important points. Uh, Rayo's predictions. I mean, <clears throat> obviously the uh, I, I guess the uh, uh, taking over a state like the Free State Project and some of these other uh, organizations and and uh, moving location like the the moving destinations uh, for liberty. Uh, yeah, he definitely kind of uh, predicted that, or he kind of laid it out for people to pursue after his death or after he disappeared, uh, which is which is definitely good. Uh, even agorism. I mean, I. There's no way for us to prove. I mean, yeah, can't can't go ask Sam Conkin, can't go uh, talk to, go, can't have a, uh, I don't know, a, a late lunch with uh, with Rayo. Uh, so, yeah, there's no way to know if uh, if uh, Conkin was actually uh, influenced by uh, Rayo's ethical enclaves or, or black markets. I I really don't know. I, I wish I could. It's going to be something that haunts me for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, uh, haunts in a good way. Uh, but yeah, PGP. Uh, he mentioned. Um, uh, he mentioned secure communicators, which uh, would would be uh, PGP on a computer, encrypted phones, uh, um, whether that's by way of off the record or uh, oh, what's the other one? Uh, off the record or uh, ZRTP? That's what it is. Zimmer Zimmerman Real Time Protocol. Uh, I mean, the the encrypted devices that he was kind of alluding to, uh, 3D printing too. He predicted 3D printing. Um, so. I mean, yeah, there, there was a lot of valuable. I mean, yeah, the, uh, some of the people that wrote about him. I think Benjamin Best called him a nerd. He looks like a nerd, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't doubt it at all. Like he was far, far ahead. Yeah, of his time. Rayo, Rayo really was a pioneer. But and it's really kind of unfortunate that much like Sam Conkin, he's kind of been thrown to the wayside by the celebritarians who will rant and rave about. Murray Rothbard and Walter Block and, you know, and thankfully even guys like Hans Hermann Hopp. But when it comes, and, and that's all nice and fine when it comes to theory and philosophy and, you know, whatever the hell. But when it comes to let's talk turkey, let's talk shop, nuts and bolts, let's make it happen. Oh, those guys suddenly are missing. Hmm. And thankfully in recent years, more people have been discovering uh, uh, Sam Conkin, and hopefully with broadcasts like this, people will also discover Rayo as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely hope so. I definitely hope so. And uh, I'm going to mention this once again, and I'm sure the listeners are sick of hearing it. Well, they shouldn't be sick of hearing it, but Vanu creates more Vanu. Um, just like what, like what Kyle mentioned with the industrial parks. I mean, Vanu potentially created more Vanu. It gave people possibilities, uh, some, some, some possibilities in, in creating their own freedom. So I think that's also valuable too. Uh, and to reiterate, I mean, what, what's Vanu today may not be Vanu 50 years, uh, 50 years from now. You know, what's Vanu today may not have been 50 years ago. So um, it's, it's, it's a, I guess, an evolving strategy uh, depending on um, the, the, current, uh, the current political affairs and, and all that good stuff. So I think that's really, really an important point to kind of end on. Uh, so I guess, uh, guys, any, any, any closing thoughts? Well, Vanu, it's very much shades of gray. Uh, you know, agorism does have its good points being very uh, stubbornly black and white and absolutist in a good sense. 
But Vanu, by uh, I would say by contrast, is very much uh, experimental and, and shades of gray. And a lot of it, too, if you think about it, is very much personal choice, much like what I was mentioning earlier in terms of, you know, do you want to pay more in gas or do you want to, you know, pay in terms of the property taxes, in terms of like settling down and owning private land like what Alex Ansari is doing now. You know, arguably, a lot of that, uh, you know, one could argue is uh, more personal choice than an issue of right and wrong necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I agree, and yes, I, I suppose yeah, I suppose, Mr. Producer, there could be fifty of shades, fifty shades of gray out there with your free mate, but uh, I don't know. That's not something that we want to we want to tackle here this <laughs> evening. Uh, but <laughs> Jason, understand? <laughs> uh, there was a lot of um, good details in in the practicing Vanu. Just to make sure uh, you learn the. To- crawl before you before you walk and uh, at least just try camping for the weekend <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's a good place to start definitely yeah you got you got to make sure you can uh you gotta make sure your mind you're, you're mentally uh able to to do that because it is it is a major change in lifestyle and obviously you don't have to do it all at one uh, all in one stride but some people i mean unfortunately with the, the i guess the Dependence on technology that there is today, a lot of people just wouldn't be able to do that. They would, they would, they would go insane, and, and uh, I mean, they either go insane uh, and or uh, just return to the servile society and, and get their normal nine to five because they can't handle it. So, um, but yeah, if, there, if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and close out the show. I'll give you guys like five seconds if you want to if you want to step in and, and say something and, and go for it. Vanu right. is a Vanu is a good option. Read up on it, listen to it, consider it, and preferably do a little bit of it. Vanu means relative physical invulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu Life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, indirectly you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. Vanu will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vanu for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you'll add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live out of sight and minds of those unwilling to let live by people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu Life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL. In this edition, we'll be discussing uh, Rayo's Vanu, the search for personal freedom, once again. Uh, for those interested in listening to or reading the book, uh, just visit tinyurl.com forward slash Vanu Rayo. Uh, again, tinyurl.com forward slash Vanu Rayo. I do apologize for all the short links, but uh, uh, but hey, it's got to be done. 
<laughs> Only uh, in this broadcast we'll be taking a different look. Uh, specifically, we'll be comparing and contrasting Vanu with other, other strategies intend, uh, included in the book, uh, although not by name. Uh, those include agorism, survivalism, frugalism, security culture, and crypto-anarchy. One of my favorite, favorite subjects. Uh, <laughs> before getting started, I'd like to provide a, a bit of background on Rayo in the book for those who may not have listened to it uh, or read it yet, uh, or for those who missed the broadcast uh, where we discussed it. So Vani was an anti-political lifestyle and strategy of voluntary social exclusion, whose ideal goal is to become as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible. The strategy of Vanu varies on an individual basis. Uh, for example, you could have a lot of interaction with the statist servile society while importing and exporting. Uh, you could become completely self-sufficient and move far out in the woods, which is what I would prefer, and uh, any combination in between. Uh, Vanu can be done individually uh, with a freemate, uh, i.e. a companion, or it can be done in a small or large group depending on, uh, on your goals. Although Rayo does recommend Vanuing by yourself first as a psychological test of the mind, can I handle this very, very dramatic lifestyle change. There are multiple strategies of Vanu discussed, uh, which include RV living, tent camping, living on the water, uh, another one that would be badass, uh, Vanuing in cities, uh, among others. Some uh, may choose to go the route that Rayo took and to disappear completely, although that's not a requirement. As mentioned previously, it depends on your goals, your strengths, and the current political climate. So on June 12th, we played section one of the audiobook for you. On June 16th, we provided an overall analysis of the book and provided our thoughts. And on June 19th, we played about half of Section 2. And although if I had to recommend one, I would recommend the uh, 16th broadcast, June 16th, uh, as a supplement to this one. I, that was, I, I would definitely say one of our better broadcasts uh, and probably one of our, most, one of our more important ones too. So uh, with that said, uh, uh, are you guys ready to uh, go ahead and jump in? Let's boogie. No. Say no? I said no. No. No, well, what, what, do you want to do something else? <laughs> um, I'd like to go to the strip club, but I, I guess I can't do that. Um, you can always bring the strip club to LUA Radio. We have all, we all have cameras. Well, actually, now that you bring it up, uh, you know, James Weeks with his libertarian uh, dance a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Um, there's been discussion of him holding a class at the MPLC Fest this year. <laughs> I'm not coming anymore. <laughs> Wow! Just I wow! Want, I want uh, I, I want my money back. <laughs> well, uh, good thing I'm an admin because I'm going to take it and keep it. <laughs> oh man! No man! No, I'll, I'll still come. I'll still come. I'll just uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Whatever. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so what we're going to do is move from the most legal to the, uh, I guess, most illegal. Uh, so frugalism, obviously, to start, and agorism to end, and in the middle, uh, crypto-anarchy, survivalism, and then security culture. So yeah, with, uh, with frugalism, uh, this was uh, the, most, the biggest pain in the ass to narrate uh, because uh, the priceless, where he went through literally everything they bought, their budgets, what they actually spent, um, yeah, that's that's the monster of the fact that uh, they were very much so practicing frugalism. Anytime they mention anything about like money or prices, yeah, that's 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 that uh, that would definitely count. Uh, shelter, uh, yeah, polypropylene a tents. Yeah, I mean, uh, very very cheap to make. He wasn't living in a, an apartment or even a tiny home. He was literally living under a damn tarp. Uh, that's that's very very minimalistic and uh, uh, very very uh, frugal. And uh, he, he also discussed uh, cheaply rigging uh, a van for, uh, for, for living aboard. Uh, so, Kyle, you have any, uh, anything to mention uh, so far? Well, what I'll just say is, um, yeah, the, the price lists were very instructive, but I think the editor, uh, Mr. Fisher, I think his name was, did mention that, you know, hey, guys, you know, make sure to adjust for inflation and, and such. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that is definitely true. Uh, without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, also, I guess, to take it one step further with uh, with the prices, like food specifically. Um, yeah, the, the food storage part does overlap with survivalism. We'll talk about that momentarily. But uh, just strictly the comparison shopping. This was another pain in the ass to narrate when he was looking in, in the, when the one that if it wasn't for archival purposes, they would be completely worthless because I'm sure these businesses, businesses that he was discussing aren't around today. Uh, when they when he was writing about him, like in the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, but yeah, he was uh, providing information on where to get cheap supplies. Uh, definitely a demonstrative demonstrative of of uh, frugalism. 
And then one other terrible part to narrate. Let me just let me just uh, um, bitch about this real quick. Uh, yeah, uh, when he was talking about uh, the topographic maps to purchase, like of the land out there in like uh, uh, in the uh, Siskiyou region, uh, Western Oregon, Northern California. Yeah, uh, he went through like uh, every every like na- every uh, what are they called? Uh, like the national park services for the various national parks and uh, told you. Uh, what latitude and longitudes to uh, longitudinal and uh, wow, I can't talk. Uh, but yeah, like what what maps to actually get uh, to uh, to live out there in that region. Uh, so yeah, I would say that's uh, definitely uh, an aspect of frugalism. And uh, yeah, I mean uh, compare. Yeah, so that was the compare contrasting. I mean, frugalism isn't really that that much different today. It's pretty much uh, consistent. Uh, no matter what time it is, you're you're trying to live uh, as uh, below your means as you possibly can. Uh, so turn it over to you guys. What do you have? Well, like, like for example, like in the price list, you, uh, there would be entries like, for example, Jorgensen's Dairy, 1300 Court Street, Medford, powdered milk, $33 per 100 pounds. So if you can imagine like an entry like that and then just done for different uh, places and all that, that, that was kind of a, a recurring thing. Or for uh, the maps that you mentioned, like this one. Willamette National Forest, Box 1272, Eugene, Oregon, 97401, 43.3 to 43.7 degrees north, 121.8 to 122.5 degrees west. So obviously those precise details may not be necessarily important, but it kind of gives an idea for how to put together those uh, lists, whether it be of maps or uh, where to get your food. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely uh, definitely a good point. Definitely a good point. Uh, Stan, Danny, any uh, comments on uh, frugalism? Well, I um, I think you know, aside from like uh, I suppose the garbage picking and all that, um, I think there should be something said about money. Uh, I think if you're a prudent person, if you're a frugal person, you should really watch where you spend your money. Uh, and in particular, you should watch, uh, the value of your money, particularly like in terms of like inflation and banking and all that. Uh, there's a lot of people who can be frugal right now with the current, uh, economic environment, but it doesn't necessarily dictate that in the future that they'll be frugal uh, as, uh, Currency, the particularly U.S. currency, loses value over time. You increasingly become less frugal because you're spending more on uh, items that were normally cheap maybe a couple of years ago. So I think it's important, uh, an important aspect of if you're going to be frugal is to look into uh, how to best. Uh, how to best uh, invest your money. I wouldn't say invest, but um, keep the value of your money. That I would consider very important because let's be honest here. Not everyone here is self-sufficient. I would argue that most people are not self-sufficient. You you do rely on another person typically to help you out in some capacity and you're willing to trade with them in some type of capacity. Uh, the, the most self-sufficient people I've met have been typically the homeless. So I think it's important to, to also understand that uh, trade is important even if you're frugal. You just have oh, to yeah, be- yeah, you're, 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 yeah, you're definitely correct. And, and, and Rayo was like – and obviously uh, as I mentioned, Rayo didn't mention any of these by name. It was just aspects of frugalism that, that arose in this book. And he talked a lot about import-export um, and, and, and obviously Vani is uh, – um, you, you obviously Vanu, you, the the choice of Vanu that you choose to the, the route you choose to go down with Vanu is uh, dependent on your lifestyle. So uh, yeah, it was, so I mean uh, they they did have to trade at times. They had to go into uh, the state of society and and get supplies and such. But uh, uh, but yeah, I mean the, the long term food storage definitely saved them uh, def- definitely saved them a lot of money. Well, it's not even just like the long t- term food storage, but like uh, you can enter a black market. The thing is, is and this is. I mean, I like Bitcoin. I do. Um, I'm a little skeptical of its price right now. But uh, if I had, like, gold coin, I'd have no problem trading that right now. Uh, 
but I would be frugal about it. You know, I'd be very careful with what I'm using that gold coin for or uh, pieces of that gold coin for. Uh, I think a healthy, and I know it sounds a little, we're getting into a little like a uh, prepper type of behavior. If you're going to be frugal is buy as much as you can of something that's important and, you know, kind of wait it out over time. Like me in particular, I've been kind of thinking about buying like maybe a year or six months worth of toilet paper. <laughs> and right now I would, I would see that as a frugal point. Like it's cheap right now to buy it. Yeah. Uh, a year from now or maybe two years from now, I, I would very much doubt that. And I think that, that, that kind of behavior is a frugal behavior. Yeah, yeah, buying buying stuff cheap and and, and buying and, and getting an actual long term supply of it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Kyle, Stan. Yeah, well, the only uh, point of contention I would have about buying a year's worth of toilet paper is that if you move from where you live within that year, I guess you would be taking your toilet paper with you, and it wouldn't really fit in the moving van or anywhere else. I guess that's more of a calculated risk, to be sure. Uh, but but that would kind of you know if you heavily. Uh, in your in your storage, in your dare shall I say your supply caches, if you're going to get you know let's say 100 pounds of rice or whatever the materials are, so that you can try and I think what we're really getting at here is stretching out your dollars. How you know how much how many goods can you buy with with that dollar? And is it wiser to buy a lot of it? of a lot of that commodity sooner rather than later because of inflation and, and other things that Danny was getting at. And that it's, it, that's a gamble, isn't it? At least to some degree. And especially if you're going to be moving anytime soon. Well, well yeah, well, yeah say... definitely. There, there's no, there's no such thing as a, I guess a completely safe investment. And, um, I would say, well, you're, you're investing in your future, you know, when it comes to those uh, necessary supplies. Uh, well, so I yeah, argue... there's always risk involved. Yeah. I would argue that uh, inflation is inherently in the future. Uh, in fact, as long as we have a central bank, there's always going to be inflation. In fact, last 10 years, um, asset prices have risen dramatically, despite the fact that there's been no general growth in terms of productivity. So uh, what we're seeing right now, yes, the stock market's up, bonds are up, but uh, in terms of actual like production, like more cars, more toilet paper, more food, that has been pretty consistent with the last maybe 20 or 30 years. So there is inflation. The problem is once that inflation really begins to spike and appear, um, I would argue right now, even before right now, like maybe a few years back, it would have been um, prudent and frugal to have uh, started storing away. That's just, that's, I mean, that's coming from an economics point of view. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, def I, I definitely know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. Uh, but let's. Uh, we, we've got about uh, five minutes until this uh, until this first break, and we'll be doing fascist book, um, which uh, should be interesting today. But uh, I want to get through uh, crypto anarchy, which is one of my favorite subjects. I think when I f first found out about it, um, <clears throat> probably a year ago. Actually, yeah, probably actually a year ago. Uh, when I first started looking into the Silk Road and watched a bunch of documentaries and found out about Aaron Schwartz, who was uh, who was crucial in uh, creating uh, Creative Commons. Um, it's fascinating, yeah. And then uh, Cody Wilson and, uh, and and all that stuff, yeah. It was fascinating. So uh, there are actually elements of crypto anarchy that were kind of uh, predicted uh, in Rayo's book. Uh, the first one that that I that I was the first one, yeah. The fir the first example Rayo uh, for the, the Rayo mentioned was uh, secure communicators, uh, which sounds an awful lot like PGP or uh, encryption on phones. Uh, really, really, really does. I mean, obviously uh, the technology wasn't available yet wasn't developed yet but uh so yeah it didn't didn't sound exactly alike but uh it was uh it was uh definitely uh, close definitely was close um kyle anything yes. you want to uh mention here well i well it's just you know rayo is just really a visionary for his time and it wasn't i think it was sometime in the 90s when phil zerman actually created pgp so the length of time I mean, yeah, you are talking more than a decade because, remind me, Rayo disappeared in 74, right? Correct, yeah. So, and, and, that, and that art, like, I guess his Secure Communicator 1 was, I think, no, it was, these were all pre-1970, I'm pretty sure, or they were obviously before 1974, but yeah. 
Sixties to seventies. So yeah, the length of time between um, at least seventy four to sometime in the nineties when Zimmerman actually went public. And for people who don't know, PGP used to be considered a munition by the federal government, like the equivalent of a goddamn bazooka. All right. <laughs> so now, thankfully, the laws have changed to where you can like. You know, take a laptop with PGP installed on it and like go through the airport at least to some degree, and they won't seize it at least for that reason. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that that's what it was at one point. And so, yeah, the length of time in terms of emerging technologies can be quite a while, but eventually it'll get there. But the fact that Rayo could see it that far at that early is, uh, I don't think it's anything less than amazing, frankly. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And just for the listeners that aren't aware of uh, of uh, uh, crypto anarchy, that's the stuff like uh, like again like Cody Wilson, uh, what Russell Burke did with Silk Road. Th- those things would be considered uh, crypto anarchy. Um, and then uh, PGP is pretty good privacy. It's encryption for email. Um, there's other things uh, like Jitsi, which has off the record and Zimmerman real time protocol. So like we're on Skype right now. Uh, Jitsi would encrypt uh, the VoIP call. Uh, so yeah, j- that's just a, a, I guess, a little basic introduction. And I wrote a tutorial on Jitsi. Kyle wrote a, tu- a tutorial on PGP. Uh, you can definitely go check those out if you're uh, interested in learning uh, more. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, he also uh, predicted uh, 3D printing too, uh, and it was actually pretty close to being accurate. It was actually yeah, it was pretty accurate. Uh, he mentioned uh, you, like, let's say. Uh, you want to make some food, you put in some organic material, you insert the program, and a couple of days later you have, uh, I don't know, wheat or something, um, which yeah, I guess, and I, I just told Kyle about this a couple of days ago, but yeah, 3D, 3D printed chocolate. It's a thing. It's a freaking thing. Um, so uh, he also mentioned like for, for building materials, like uh, you insert some sawdust, insert the program, and you come out with building materials or something, um, which they 3D printed houses too. Uh, we discussed that one. San. Uh, provided insight on uh, the, I guess, on, on 3D printing. Uh, so that's taken off, and, and Ray was uh, was definitely a, vi- a visionary when it came to that. He predicted a lot of things uh, that have become uh, realities. Um, and uh, also, I guess, I guess, Ghost Gunner might be another uh, exemplification of that. Uh, for those who are aren't aware of what that is, uh, Cody Wilson from Defense Distributed. Uh, it's essentially you, you pretty much uh, <laughs> machine your own gun. Uh, and uh, if you want to go purchase that, uh, you can just go to uh, defdist.org and uh, $250 down payment. I don't know what it's actually going to cost. Uh, they don't tell you yet. Um, I doubt I'll be able to afford it. It's probably in the thousands of dollars, I would imagine. But uh, if you have the money for it, uh, make yourself some uh, rifles. Make, make yourself some guns. Uh, definitely recommend that. And uh, the, there was also one other thing mentioned when it came to uh, the secure communicators. And it was you mentioned underground banking. And uh, that seems to be pretty close to uh, what, what, crypt, what, what cryptocurrency is. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into survivalism, one of the things that will be, or one of the sections that will be longer. So, I guess uh, just some examples of survivalism that Rayo mentioned in the book. Uh, one of the many, uh, he discussed food extensively, as we kind of alluded to earlier. Uh, he used 55-gallon uh, drums uh, for storage, for, for long-term, long-term storage of food. This is a quote from page 63 of the PDF that you can find at uh, tinyurl.com forward slash Vani Rayo. Quote, our long-term storage of grains and nuts is within an, in- within, inert- within an inert atmosphere in polyethylene bags and sealed drums. To obtain the inert atmosphere, we put half-ounce dry ice per gallon volume in bottom of drum, pour in food, tie bag loosely and place top loosely on drum. After a few hours, the dry ice will evaporate, bottom of drum will no longer feel cold, and pressure will be equalized. Then we tie the bag and seal the drum tightly. We have stored wheat this way for over three years, and it was at least a year old when we bought it. It still sprouts well." End quote. Uh, but yeah, there was one other mention of uh, of drums for short for uh, short term storage, but uh, yeah, you get the point. Uh, as he was trying out some some new things, and uh, it appears that uh, appears that it was uh, successful. He was definitely a pioneer, uh, unless he found that out from somebody else. He didn't he didn't necessarily uh, define that or, or mention uh, where he got that from. But uh, Doctor Gatherer, uh, who is uh, not a male, uh, sprouted a lot of a uh, lot of different food, foods. I was I was mentioned quite extensively as well. <clears throat> Um, uh, and this was kind of the, this is kind of the, the, the weird parts. I mean, uh, they trap for rats, snakes, and squirrels and forage for wild edibles. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine eating, I mean, obviously if you have to eat it for your survival, I understand, but like eating rats and snakes, squirrels, yeah, yeah, cool, squirrels. 
Um, but yeah, that just seems, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it's something you adapt to. Uh. <laughs> well, there's people, well, there, well, there's all sorts of people in, uh, like the far East or other portions of the world, actually Vietnam in particular, at least, at least they used to be where that was actually a normal everyday common occurrence. And in many places around the world, the so-called third world, particularly that is a, uh, walk in the park. It is a fact of daily life. So, uh, now, there could be an argument that could be said in terms of lower life expectancy, higher mortality rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of not dying within, well, survival rule of three, right? Uh, not dying within three weeks, then yes, uh, you could say that, that the rats and the vermin and so forth actually serve their purpose. But of course, as any doctor will tell you, there's an increased risk for such things like hantavirus and other such things. Um, I mean, arguably, if you had to make a decision, you know, that snake that uh, Rayo mentioned is probably a little bit better, at least from a medical yeah. standpoint, arguably. Yeah. Yeah. And the squirrels, I mean, that's uh, I was I, my, my dad was meaning to take me uh, squirrel hunting, but it just never happened with a busy schedule. But uh, um, but uh, yeah, I would eat a, I would eat a squirrel. That, that doesn't actually seem that gross. You know, I don't know. Stan, have you ever eaten a squirrel? Yeah, they aren't too bad, actually. I figured. I figured you have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, the only real problem with actually, uh, you know, cleaning the the squirrels and you know, gutting them and skinning them and all that, their hides are really. I don't know. People who may not have gone hunting may 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 not be able to relate to this necessarily. But if you like, if you and a buddy are actually like pulling the skin apart on the carcass, they are really tough and they stick on there like nothing else. I mean, you really gotta. It's not even yank. It's like you have to have like a steady force and gradually just peel it off. Uh, but yeah, like again, it's if a lot like want skin to... in a catfish for anyone who, is, <laughs> who isn't well, it... who's not familiar with squirrel. It's kind of like you grab one end and you just with the pliers and you just pull. Yeah, it's like a steady thread in... pull. Yep. Well, and yeah, and if people want to prepare for the apocalypse, or as is the case here, more of a an issue, more of an issue of self sufficiency in the here and now before so called doomsday, you know, there's nothing wrong with like taking a weekend and going fishing, or in this case, going hunting, and and kind of dare shall I say, field testing some of this stuff, and preferably, you know, don't go alone. Go with somebody who's actually done this type of force; so they can kind of show you the ropes. Uh, an impromptu mentorship, if you will, would actually kind of shorten the learning curve there. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and what since we're talking about eating uh, uh, unconventional animals, I mean, uh, <clears throat> like, what about uh, what about like a coyote? Have 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 you any of you ever heard of anyone eating coyote? Um, I've never had luck hunting them, so I've never actually really had the opportunity. Yeah, they can be a little, uh, they can be a little, uh, lucrative at times, um, hard to find. And that's hmm. normally when that's the case, it's like, oh, I wouldn't say that eating a coyote would come up often in any of these and situations. See, that's, that's strange. And, and that's strange because, um, uh, like here in here in the communist state of Illinois, they don't even require you have like uh, a tag for them. Like if you see one, you can just kill one to send them out because there's so damn many of them. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like every time I've been hunting, you you see like uh, two a like you you probably see one or two a day, um, like yeah. pretty close to you. So like like down where where we hunt at, oh yeah, you could you could you could mm -hmm. get um, if if you can find a good way to. Uh, uh, to to cook coyote, you could you could probably do okay at it, uh, but I don't know if that's conventional to eat at all. I, I I we I've never tried it. Yeah, it might just be the difference of the uh, area where I'm from. It just might be a little bit of a slimmer pickings, as it were. But yeah, you know, that's just depends on your environment. It's like here, it's like snakes. Well, <laughs> that'd be a not very much meat on the bones, let's just say. Our largest species of uh, snake is about a king snake, and it only gets up to about two feet long. Yeah. And it's only about as thick, at maximum, as thick as a garden hose. You wouldn't uh, sustain very well off of that, but it would be protein if you really needed it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got you, got you. And then, and then there's also uh, this is something I have done. I mean, when we're uh, foraging for for wild edibles, uh, I mean uh, mushroom hunting, you can get a you can get a big mess of mushrooms uh, 
<clears throat> which we had, we had got a couple of big messes of mushrooms uh, earlier this year, a uh, month or month, month, month ago, maybe. And then, uh, uh, I mean, when we're riding, I mean, there's just so many blackberries everywhere. Uh, like you just stop on the side of the trail and have like when you're riding and you just take you just stop and you, you have a little snack. Uh, so that's that's mm-hmm. that's definitely a positive. Uh, but that does t- Kyle, we were talking about this. Uh, it takes it takes a lot of uh, like for, for foraging for wild edibles. And Ray, we even mentioned this. Uh, you shouldn't expect like uh, uh, it, it's gradual. Uh, you might get uh, you might get a couple meals out of uh, foraged edibles like the first few years you're vonuing. Uh But yeah, don't expect uh, don't expect like to, to supplement most of your most of your uh, food from that uh, because it is uh, it is uh, not easy to do. Uh, and you got to be uh, it takes uh, it takes a lot of time to uh, to research uh, what is edible and what is not, right, Kyle? Yeah, and even and even when you do know what you're looking for, and you're acting much more like how the natives of old did. Uh, the fact of the matter is that this is not at all like going to the grocery store. Okay, so it's not going to be sit there on a you know on a shelf uh, looking pretty much similar to all the other foods. Okay, so stop being a consumer. Stop it, and just understand that when you're out in nature. Getting your food directly uh, out of the dirt, uh, proverbially speaking, the food's going to look uh, kind of different from place to place, even from even the exact species of uh, flora or even fauna, uh, especially. I mean, people are when people think of like uh, meats, like chicken or or whatever, they're they're thinking of like the uh, butterball turkeys or whatever uh, that all look identical. However, if you're actually going out and hunting the animals, there's actually a, a range. A, Almost an individuation of sorts, but they look noticeable. The animals, even of the same species, look noticeably different when you're getting them out in the wild. So what you see at a grocery store and what you see out in the wild are going to be noticeably, noticeably different. And quite frankly, and maybe Danny could help me out here because there's an economic term that actually is relevant here, but I can't remember it exactly. How much effort you put into something relative to how much of what you get out of it is actually rather important. So, for example, if it, you, if it takes you three hours to go, to go hunting and you only get, like, let's say, five squirrels, that actually may not be worth it, as opposed to if you took only one hour and you nail a buck that can feed you for, let's say, a week. Um, well, there's multiple terms that can describe that. Uh, you could say utility, profitability, um, efficiency. That's not... There's a number of terms that can be applied to that type of uh, application. I was initially thinking maybe risk reward uh, ratio or well, something. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's an accurate term, but I was thinking more like uh, kind of like a. Yeah, you are correct. I was just thinking, I, I guess, a bit more fundamentally rather than that sure. specific term. Sure. Sure, but but yes, but what I'm saying is that when you are out foraging for wild edibles, fishing, hunting, etc., etc., you are engaging in an, in an economic activity not totally different than when you go to the grocery store. However, the specific details of how you go about doing that, what your expectations are, have to change when you're doing stuff out in the wild. And a lot of people really don't understand that. Uh, thankfully, for people who do have experience, who have done it at least once or twice or a handful of times before, uh, you kind of know that because you've done it just with your experience. But uh, a lot of other folks who may not have ventured outside the fluorescent lighting of these uh, artificial environments called grocery stores may not necessarily understand that. And so as long as their expectations realign with reality that, hey, that cactus is going to look somewhat different from that cactus over there, and same with the chipmunks and, and deer and other uh, fauna and so forth, then you can actually – kind of understand. And Shane, you mentioned something a moment ago about the food may not last you as long, the wild food and all that. That's another uh, thing that kind of comes up too. And I think Rayo mentioned about make sure you have enough storable foods and all that, because, you know, if you come up short in your wild edibles, uh, you might be going hungry for a bit if you don't have that storable food as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, uh, he's like, uh, even, I think it's like five, like a few years in after he was vonuing, uh, they, they essentially used, uh, I guess, foraged foods uh, to make their uh, to make their storables last longer, uh, so they weren't relying on the on the uh, on the uh, wild edibles per se, but they were yeah using them to uh, make their their store their storable foods uh, last longer. Um, 
want to move forward. Uh, the majority of the self-seeking Green Revolution chapter was devoted specifically to homesteading, uh, which you know, is for survivalism, self-sufficiency. And uh, most of it was also a discussion on the book Go Ahead and Live by Mildred Loomis, sometimes known as the grandmother of the counterculture. Uh, and I want to go ahead and put this on screen for the benefit of the live stream viewers. And uh, there is one copy on Amazon. Uh, it's uh, collectible. This is going to cost. This does cost half as much as as Vanu. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, grandmother of the counterculture and something. A chap a chapter of the book that uh, Rayo extensively discussed. I wouldn't mind getting my hands on that and uh, doing the same thing that uh, uh, that I did for uh, for Vanu. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, if you're interested in that and uh, want to see that happen. Um, yeah, feel free. Uh, feel free to uh, contribute the money uh, for for that purchase. Uh, if you if you want it, that's fine. If not, uh, yeah, it doesn't doesn't really make a difference to me. But hey, if uh, the listeners or readers uh, want to uh, take a look at that book, I'd be more than happy to uh, to actually uh, put forth the work in digitizing it. So I uh, just thought I'd put that out there. And uh, now we're back to shelter once again. Uh, definitely uh, survivalism. Uh, there's no reliance on apartments or RVs. Uh, uh, again, the polypropylene a tent and uh, van, van dwelling on public lands. Uh, that is definitely self-sufficient. No reliance on landlords, on, uh, um, on I guess, uh, rent or, or anything of that nature. Uh, any, any of you guys have anything to mention for shelter? Yeah, Alex Ansari is the man, dude. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he, he's been, he's been uh, especially for the, uh, uh, the RV living uh, and yeah, self sufficiency too. I mean, yeah, he's been he's been pretty good at doing that. So, uh, yeah, go check out Alex Ansari's stuff. Uh, I haven't been to his channel in a few days, but you can go check, you can go watch go watch the videos of uh, him uh, walking through his uh, his new property that he purchased. So, um, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, Sea Mobile, uh, whether it's intentional floating community or just a uh, garden in the middle of the ocean, uh, that's definitely uh, um, survivalism. Uh, and I mentioned in that uh, June 16th broadcast the the idea of uh, you you get uh, obviously like you have your uh, what do you call them trimarans uh, the the trimarans you get that like I would say I would say close to like an ocean or something or not an ocean close to an island uh, and then anchor down there uh, and then just have like uh, a few like good sized pontoon boats and then put like uh, uh, whatever whatever the uh, uh, the size of the pontoon is just build raised beds. And then just lay out some soil in there, and I mean, out there in the ocean, they'd get plenty of sun. You just have to have to have to find a way to water, uh, water that. Uh, but you're out in the ocean, so it really shouldn't be that big of a problem. Uh, so I mean, there's so many that, and I mentioned this in the 16th broadcast, but that's like the most appealing to me. Like that'd be badass just to live out there in the water. And uh, there are some, there are definitely some ways you could you could get that done. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys got any thoughts on that one? Yeah, there is a uh, there's a video up on uh, YouTube where there's this lady who's actually living young younger lady who's actually living in her own boat and she's just like sailing like all the time. And the video part of the video title is like minimalism, tiny home, sea, or some combination of those keywords. Okay, so she's yeah, that, already that's, doing that's, it. That's, that's a good point. So what I'm what I'm going to do because okay, so when we come back from when we come back from break, I'll go ahead and get that that Dropbox uh, get that transferred to our Dropbox, Mr. Producer. Um, uh, it's only it, it should be there by the time we get back from break. Uh, but I do want to play that uh, for the benefit of the listeners uh, because I really I, I did enjoy that video. Thanks for bringing it up, Kyle. I completely forgot about it. this. Will just be in our main folder, Mr. Producer. Um, all right, so it's it's uh, transferring right now. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'll play that video when we get back, but yeah, go ahead, Kyle. I'm sorry. No, though, that was it. It was just that that lady's actually doing it right now and they caught that on camera. So this is no longer some theoretical, uh, pie in the sky thing, like how many statists like to accuse libertarians of. This is a very practical real world happening right now, whether you like it or not kind of thing. So, you know, for people who have issues with, uh, when libertarians try to experiment with some things, uh, quite frankly, I think some of them can, you know, suck up the end of a tailpipe. The fact of the matter is that people are trying to rob us of our freedoms, and there are people, whether libertarians or not, who are experimenting with different methods and techniques to try and see what works. And there is this lady who is living at sea right now, and they caught it on tape. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I watched that. It, it was probably like one in the morning, and I just forgot to. And this it actually is before the Thursday show, so I wasn't even thinking about this one. But yeah, I'm glad you. Uh, uh, you brought that up, and we'll get that played. Uh, and when we come back, 
Uh, but perpetual traveling uh, could also be an aspect of uh, of survivalism, I suppose. Um, he discussed it just just a little bit, uh, just as a, p- a potential option. Uh, work in the United States, but spend your money in the Bahamas, uh, or in other words, uh, don't spend your money where you earn it at. Uh, was was one of the recommendations that uh, that he had, and uh, that could also be combined with living on the sea too. Um, so you could uh, you could go back to uh, whatever 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 country, whether it's the United States. Uh, or wherever it is, uh, and uh, you can, <laughs> yeah, work there and then go live out and live out in the ocean. So um, we got about a minute and a half. Any closing thoughts on, on what we've discussed so far? And then we will, because uh, uh, I want to kind of stop here and when we come back, I can play that uh, um, that minimalism on the C clip. Uh, but yeah, any closing thoughts before we go to breaks, gentlemen? Yeah, the perpetual traveling probably has some connection with expatriation as a legal remedy, at least for some people. But that, quite honestly, does bear further investigation because that's not for everybody. Do you have that uh, clip ready? Go for it. Yep. Enjoy. They definitely grew up playing outside, enjoying nature, sailing, on the water, Lake Michigan. But I lived in a big house. And I had a lot of stuff in that house. So living aboard a boat is a little bit, is a lot different from how I grew up. I don't miss a thing. I don't miss a thing. We had a, we had a house fire in my parents' house years ago. All of my personal belongings were at home. Everything was there. And a lot of things were lost or damaged. And um, I don't miss any of it. I didn't miss a thing. It was almost like a burden lifted off my shoulders. It was like, I don't need these things. It's more fun without them. Less to organized and clean. <laughs> Why do I live on a boat? Well, I live on a boat because because the scenery is always changing. I mean, I could live in a really small apartment, but the scenery wouldn't change. It's not confining. Even though like my cabin is wicked small, it's like the size of a small closet, it's not confining because I have a horizon everywhere and so much open space. We're Oh, wait a minute, where are we? We're in um, Atlantic City, Atlantic City, New Jersey. A little rainy out there. It's rainy and stormy and there's a storm coming, so we're staying here for two days. And we're making a big breakfast feast. Even if you're at anchor for months, which I've done that, <laughs> the weather changes and it's fun. Here we are. <laughs> this is good breakfast and this is a good idea. I think it's aesthetically beautiful. It's co- so cozy and the practicality of it is beautiful too. I'm going to give you a tour of the sailing vessel Daphne. Um, this is the galley, which is the kitchen. This is my refrigerator, my icebox here. Dory likes almond milk. Come here, Dory. It's easier just dealing with something that's so small and contained than managing so much more. We have a sink. We've got a two burner stove under here. The head right here. Dory's litter box. And this is the saloon. This is where I sit for lunch. And that's it. That's the entire boat. When I first started downsizing, I thought, someday I'm going to live on a boat. And so I thought I would only keep as much stuff as could fit in my car. I put a few boxes in storage at my parents. But the rest of it, I moved aboard my boat. And the rest of it I gave away. I, I took, I would take carloads full of it to Goodwill. Stuff that I thought was really nice, I gifted to friends. And then expensive items like cameras and stuff, I sold anyway. Well, I also live on a boat because I want to own a boat. And I can't really afford to own a boat and, and not. So I chose the boat. I moved aboard so that I could have adventures and travel. There is a squall line and the boat won't stop rocking back and forth. I'm trying to sleep. It's pretty windy and the waves are pretty big, taking on water in the cockpit. So I'm trying, trying to get some rest. conscious of what I bring aboard Daphne because 
well, usually it has to fit in a backpack because that's how I get it aboard Daphne because I have to row out to the boat. And um, it's got to be small. Daphne's small. When I sailed down from Martha's Vineyard to Florida, I stopped at Anchorage a lot. So I would hitch a ride into town or bike. I have a folding bike aboard. I would bike to go to the grocery store or walk. My refrigerator's under here. I don't have a freezer. I don't carry any meat. Daphne's a vegetarian boat. So I pack anything that I can find in a grocery store, but I have to plan for longer durations because I can't always get to a grocery store. I can only carry so much food in my backpack when I get to the grocery stores. I pack the, the stuff that lasts the longest in the bottom of the refrigerator. The eggs, the cheese, the green tomatoes, the carrots. I think the green apples last the longest. I have a bunch of oranges left. This broccoli is starting to go bad, so I'm going to have to eat that next. And definitely, if you're planning for a long trip, buy green tomatoes that are perfectly round. This one used to be green, and it's ready to ripe and ready to eat. And I have food hiding in about every corner of this boat. And they're stored all over my boat. I have lockers in the sole of the boat. I have there's st food stored on the shelves, food stored underneath the seats, all over the place. It's kind of fun finding food months later that I forgot was there. What are you doing? Okay, Miss Producer, you can uh, go ahead and cut it there. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That's a practical example of someone actually going out there and living on the water. Uh, and for you that, for those of you who have cats like I do, apparently you can take your cats on the boat, uh, which was something I didn't really expect. But uh, yeah, you can take your kitties with you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just just one question for the listeners to contemplate. How many sovereign citizens and how many anarchist politicians are going to do what that lady did? Just 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 throwing it out there for people to consider when they're gauging the efficacy of certain methods that are being promoted. Just just ask your fellow neighborhood sovereign citizen or anarchist politician if they're going to go and uh, you know go live on a boat like that. Uh, I think brave lady did, and I think the answers will be very illuminating. Yeah, yeah, she's she's uh, she's very very uh, courageous. Uh, she took a, a, a leap, and it'd be nice to do. It'd be I, I, like I said, that's that's the most appealing appealing one to me, other than just going out to the middle of the woods down southern Illinois and, and just homesteading. Uh, but uh, but yeah, yeah, that's uh, definitely a, a very very good video. I'll put I'll put a, a link to that in the show notes uh, in case anyone's interested in uh, finishing that up. So let's go ahead and move forward to uh, Vonnewing in cities. So. Um, and this is still in regards to survivalism. So uh, this has actually been a reality in the in the recent decades. Uh, uh, Kyle, can you fill in the listeners on that? Well, sure. Uh, um, there, there are several different things I could point out to. But um, I guess if we're going to start off with what Rayo was kind of suggesting, uh, which is something kind of along the lines of like the speakeasies during alcohol prohibition, where there were kind of like these hidden structures in, in urban areas, I guess something like those uh, those former speakeasies could be converted into kind of like a what Rayo called Vanu shelters. Um, there could be, well, there is my idea that I mentioned on that other episode about uh, maybe trying to find something in an industrial park or even a, for those more on a budget, since apparently I've been checking around and industrial parks actually cost quite a bit. I didn't, I wasn't quite oh, prepared yeah. for that. <laughs> uh, perhaps, perhaps a little bit more affordable option would be like certain types of like larger garages in certain commercial districts or whatever that are not in urban areas necessarily, where the rent is at least somewhat comparable that, that you would have for a um, uh, for an apartment or a nicer apartment anyway. But but you get a lot more space and. I guess in some ways it would be like a studio apartment, except you can, you know, also have like a machine shop or something like that, I suppose, or, or other things. Uh, maybe like an in-house business if you keep everything on the down low, I suppose. Um, one thing I do want to mention here in terms of a more solid example is that there was a bunch of um, – and yeah, I might get a lot of crap over this, but what the hell. There was actually a bunch of syndicalists over in Europe somewhere – uh, that put together something called the Edinburgh Student Housing Cooperative. And they have their whole direct democracy weekly get-togethers where they basically say, okay, Jim's going to, you know, be the maintenance guy and so-and-so is going to, you know, collect the rent from everybody. And so 
it's a very different model, but I guess that could be an arguably a type of Vanu maybe, except you're now Vanuing with other people and it's more of a communal effort, which I'm not quite certain what the status of that uh, housing cooperative is, but, but uh, at least it's something noticeably different perhaps. I mean, maybe I guess maybe other people could chime in on that one. But the fact of the matter is that, yeah, if <laughs> you don't have to go out into uh, the wild yonder, it's definitely possible to Vanu in cities, but you've got to be really careful about it. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Because, uh, I mean, obviously, um, as is probably obvious, you uh, have to be uh, a lot more careful. So it's a lot harder to be become invulnerable to coercion when you're at the center of the coercion. So, uh, but it is possible. And not everyone has the, uh, I guess, uh, not everyone has the, I say that is at that place in their life where they can just move out of the city. Uh, some people just aren't suited to go live out in the woods, and that might actually be a better option for them, which is why Vani was so great, is because it's uh, completely customizable to. Uh, your current life situation. So, so yeah, that was that was definitely a good point. You can pre you can prep in cities. Uh, you, you can do all of that stuff, uh, and I guess you could survive potentially dangerous scenarios as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any closing thoughts on that before we move on to the last point uh, for the uh, survival survivalism section? Yeah, I I would say that you pretty much have to consider the tiny home people to be in kind of an odd experiment. And really the question for the listeners would be this. Would you consider the tiny home people to be less vulnerable to coercion or perhaps more vulnerable to coercion because of the building codes, because of nuisance abatement? That is a question I think that's, the listeners really need to contemplate on as far as the tiny that's, home that's people a good specifically. Question. Yep, that's a that's, good question, uh, and, I, and I think, uh, and, and you, yeah, you mentioned uh, exactly because I remember uh, one of uh, uh, one of Adam Kokesh's videos where he's interviewing a Bernie Sanders. Uh, she she had she like led a group for Bernie Sanders, like a thousand people, and it was she was they were out there protesting the tiny home codes and such. Um, so yeah, it's a very very real thing, and uh, I would think that the tiny home, like yeah, the tiny home thing would make you more more uh, vulnerable to coercion. I don't think it would necessarily be Vanu. Now, if you did it, if you there are other ways you can do it too. I saw uh, there was this uh, like you put it behind uh, like your car or your uh, truck or your RV, um, <clears throat> and it's it's a really really small trailer, but it's got solar panels. Um, so like you pretty much have a bed. You ha like you have a bed on one side, your your counter on the other, and that's the entire thing. And you could park it wherever you want to. You've got power from the solar panels. Like that's that's a tiny home. That's a really really tiny home. Uh, and I think you can definitely be Vanu in that. Uh, so I guess it just depends on. I mean, obviously the uh, tiny homes are appealing to, to to I guess to socialists. We had you on to discuss freakinism and dumpster diving. Um, they aren't big fans of of corporate consumerism. So. Um, I guess for them, uh, moving out into the middle of the woods may not be as appealing, which is why they're trying these tiny homes in, in cities or in urban areas, and it's not working out too well, uh, I, I think, for the majority because of nuisance abatement. Right, and just one thing very briefly before going on. The tiny house people and the freegans actually are more similar than not. Some people have mentioned about the tiny house people being like survivalists or preppers or whatever, and it's like, eh, Sort of, but if it had to fall one way, arguably, and obviously we're talking about collective trends here. We're not talking about you know specific individuals, uh, at least not not tonight. Uh, I would suggest the collective trend would be more towards the dumpster diving and uh, living in harmony with nature and going om a lot. Um, that's just that's just kind of how it's turned out. Is is not so much. Is not really so much. Let me put it this way: they're they're basically the non-reformist environmentalists, uh, to 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 be quite frank, and that's that's kind of where the similarity is. So yeah, they're, they're the tiny house people are definitely against corporate consumerism, especially in the form of the McMansions, which is what they are directly competing against. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and well said. Um, so uh, I guess that the last point: in survivalism. Uh, the chapter is survey on Siski region. Uh, now, whenever you're going to do anything, obviously, the, the, w w no matter what it is, whether you're buying a house, whether you're, um, I don't know, uh, buying a laptop, or whether you're, whether you're planning to go uh, sur uh, survive out in the middle of the woods, uh, there are a lot of variables that come into play, and it would behoove you to, uh, to examine all of those and find out what, what is actually best for you. Well, Rayo did that, uh, and he, uh, he gave tips on, or he, he provided uh, 
advice on, on how others who were planning on moving out to the Siski region could, could do it. Uh, he discussed uh, the geography, the terrain, elevation, climate precipitation, uh, and uh, the, uh, just the overall weather of, uh, of, of that region. And obviously he recommends uh, <clears throat> no matter where you're going, you, you should know those things. You, you really should. Um, so, yeah, that's all I've got to say on that. Kyle, Stan? Nah. Nothing. All right. We'll move nah. forward to uh, the more important, the more important section of the. I guess they're, they're all important sections, but just <laughs> that point, that point there is just kind of an impassing one. So security culture. Oh boy. So the first thing I want to mention. Oh, well, actually, Kyle. First off, d define security culture for those who may not uh, be aware of the the concept. What, what are we talking about here? Well, there's multiple different definitions, but the one I've had to uh, jimmy up, and I think I've used it. I think we've actually both used in our articles. I think is that security culture is. The direct application of the right to privacy. And then everything after that point is just how do you do it? It's, it's just a, it's not a philosophical thing because the philosophical thing is the right to privacy. Security culture is, okay, now that the philosophical ideological stuff is kind of uh, taken as a given, nuts and bolts, let's talk shop, how do we make it happen? And that is what security culture tries to answer. Very good, very good. So... Ray was a big advocate of security culture. He never used the term, but uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the articles I married on the Liberty Under, uh, Liberty Under Attack website by a gentleman named Benjamin Best, uh, who actually met up with Ray on I think it was uh, Vani Week, uh, and he went out and and hung out with Ray and, and Ray built him a tent and they talked about anarchism and all sorts of fun stuff. But there was one point uh, that was uh, in that article that was just so <laughs> demonstrative of, of security culture it wasn't even funny. So. Uh, this is a quote from that article. Uh, quote, Tom mailed a list of code names corresponding to actual names of creeks, roads, and other geographical features of the area where I was to meet him. He later sent a description of how to find his rendezvous spot, which made reference to the code names. I had some trouble finding the initial turnoff and considered require, uh, inquiring at a local store. One suggested that that would not be a very Vanu thing to do. So we ended up driving around a bit more until we convinced ourselves of the correct, uh, correct turn. Later, when I mentioned my difficulty to Tom, he made reference to the local reference to the store where I could have inquired. I also had trouble driving 1.6 miles down the road with a car whose odometer had no tens of miles. I ended up driving in circles to zero the thing and then trying to estimate. By following a treasure map type series of pacings and turns at various codenamed landmarks, we, incur uh, we managed to be at the rendezvous spot at the prearranged time. Tom whistled a prearranged tune from the bushes, and I whistled a prearranged tune in reply. End quote. <laughs> so, Kyle, what do, what do you think about that? Well, overall, I, I think they were being very, very careful, and for some types of things, I think that's fine. Although I will take an opportunity and nitpick, though. I think Lynn didn't understand what Vanu was. I really don't see how asking someone for directions, even a perfect stranger, would somehow make you more vulnerable to coercion. But again, I think this is something that's more evocative of when, when a concept or a methodology, a way of do of both looking, perceiving, and doing things is so pioneering and so ahead of its time that even the very first, let's say, early adopters may not even necessarily understand what they're doing or, or what they're trying to do. So that, that's more of a nitpicky. But as far as like the actual security culture part of it, it goes, I think maybe the worst thing is maybe they're overkilling it, but it's not entirely a bad thing. I mean, me personally, if the choice was overkill versus being lazy about it to, and being lazy to the extent that you wet that something bad happens. I would rather err on the side of caution personally. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. And in Lynn's defense, it, um, if uh, anyone's go check out that article, she like the, uh, who was it? Ben met, Ben met her at like, uh, I don't know. It was like, uh, like a prepping, like, like a, a prepping week or something like that. Uh, and she was not a libertarian or an anarchist at all. She just, she just wanted to be out, be back out in nature. Uh, so she probably, I think, I think Ben met her like a month before too. So like, I'm sure she really didn't have much of an idea of, of what Vani was. So yeah, just, just in her defense, but, uh, <clears throat> moving forward, the, the whole notion of import export is itself uh, a security culture minded concept. Um, boundaries, boundaries, uh, Kyle, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, from what Rayo was getting at, uh, export is essentially exporting your labor, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to, uh, <laughs> you know, get, get the moolah in return. 
uh, an import was really just uh, you know supply acquisition. You know, going out. Hell, from uh, the the earlier part of the broadcast where it was mentioned about frugality, those price lists and all that. All that stuff is import, by the way. At least according to what Rayo was getting at. So yeah, the mm-hmm. idea. I guess a little bit more of a. I don't want to use that adjective, but kind of a more let's just say basic idea about the outside world. That outside world is out there, and in here we have our Vanu shelter, our own culture and civilization, micro civilization, I guess, and a portal. There is a portal between the two, and I guess you could describe that portal between the two as your import export, export the labor, import the supplies. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is true. Well said. Uh, so the Vanu shelter. This is um, like this is probably the the biggest thing. Well, this was the biggest thing in Rayo's mind. It was the first step before you did anything else. Uh, was the Vanu shelter? I mean, I, I don't know about. Uh, I know for me and and probably uh, probably for Kyle and, and maybe for Stan too. I don't know, but probably for most people, the place they spend most of their time is at their house. Uh, so that would be the first thing that you would want to Vanu. And in that, in, uh, in that book, Va- uh, Rayo lays out uh, exactly how to do that. Uh, but yeah, that is, uh, that is huge on security culture. It's much like, uh, Kyle just released an article on, uh, home hardening. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's one, that's the first thing you, that's the first thing you should do. And, uh, probably the most important part. Um, yeah, considering you spend most of your time there. Well, yeah, and and although in that particular article of mine, I did mention the what Ray would call the le- legal interstices of you know stand your ground laws and castle doctrine and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, Ray kind of took a dim view of of legal interstices, and I don't necessarily completely disagree with him about that. Um, but yes, as far as like the Vanu shelter goes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there can be legal protections so-called on paper with the government's monopoly laws, but the fact of the matter is when there's a home invasion, at that exact moment, you know, does any sort of laws really matter? Like, in the moment when things are happening, in the real, not some crappy, you know, bunch of lawyer legalese talk, but in the moment when property is being destroyed, when physical bodies are in motion, you know, do laws really matter? And I would submit that the laws only matter after the fact. In terms of, well, we're going to have an investigation and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah but, yeah, but I, if I remember correctly, so I think Rayo took a rather uh, dim view as well of, uh, what was the term he used? Bludgies or something? Yep, yep, bludgies, bludgies. I, I want to mention one thing here too because uh, Rayo did advocate for home hardening. Although, like when you're living in a propylene A10 out in the middle of the woods, it is a little different than if you live in like a house and you're, you're, put, you're installing like a... Uh, uh, much better windows and doors and stuff. But uh, I remember distinctly in the in the book he was mentioning uh, um, like just ways to harden your uh, your your Vanu home and then also just the area around your Vanu home where you're going to be where you're going to be frequently. And he mentioned like uh, putting up cans to like deter helicopters or something. Um, and then uh, he mentioned uh, like uh, planting like I think m- maybe planting bushes or finding a spot where there are bushes that would deter people from entering into your area. Um, so it, it, I guess it was more natural home hardening, but but nonetheless, uh, it's still uh, still still similar, still similar. Well, and but also keep in mind that also uh, the location of uh, your home, your domicile, your vanu shelter, what have you is, you know, is itself a form of hardening. And, and I would submit that being in a rural area is, is arguably a lot safer than being in some urban areas, uh, all things being equal, because, I mean, whether you're looking at it from more of a principal point of view in terms of, you know, where am I paying my utilities to, especially because a lot of some municipal, you know, there are municipal governments that do, that you will pay the, uh, you know, electric bill to or, or some other things too, right? Um, versus, well, if I'm out in the sticks, you know, I'm supplying, I'm my own electric company with my battery bank and my solar panels and whatever the hell else. Uh, but then of course, if you are facing kind of a, um, Schumer hit it, hitting the fan situation, uh, you know, that golden horde, uh, coming out of the cities might just kill you. So, you know, in, you know, whether it's some sort of emergency or it's day to day life, uh, the vulnerability to coercion, can be lessened if uh, if you've got if you're doing some home hardening. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, in this point, I'll just mention in passing because it's a it's a pretty obvious one. But his security culture improved. Um, 
I mean, obviously, like when he first started writing articles, he used his real name, which we're not going to say on the air here. Um, he used his uh, real name, and then he uh, switched to the use of pseudonyms. That definitely helped his security culture. But uh, um, when, when he when he uh, stopped participating in the alternative media altogether, when he actually disappeared, um, that definitely increased his security culture. Now, it wasn't just uh, his participation, uh, though he, he was being public about his personal life in order to promote the concept. So it's much like Konkin. Um, <clears throat> I would even say it's, it's much like my security culture is not great because my name's. So if you search my, if you Google my name, that's just gonna. It's not gonna fare well for for future job employers. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the use of pseudonyms and also just the the fact that he exited the alternative media altogether. The next thing I want to mention here is uh, uh, Rayo discussed uh, the libertarian delivery man. Uh, this is from page eighty two of the PDF quote. This brings me to the retired farmer with a pickup truck who Adam proposed hiring. It is one thing to get some stuff hauled around once a year. It is something else to get mail parcels picked up and delivered every couple of weeks, which is what we would like. The latter service requires somebody who is not only reliable, but closed mouth and in sympathy since he is apt to be hassled sooner or later. There are such people we know several, but they are far, uh, few and far between, end quote. Um, now that would also, I guess, coincide with, with something, uh, something similar to mail drops. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but Ray specifically mentioned uh, mail drops with other vonuists. Like uh, if you're going to, if you're in the area, um, obviously uh, they'll exchange letters. And once they get more familiar with each other, they can have mail drops. So they can save money on uh, postage. So Kyle Stan, let's open it up. What do you guys? What do you guys have? Well, I think the topic of mail drops has been seldom discussed in the alternative media, and. Um, at some point, it would be nice to get into some some detail about that. For now, I think what people should understand about mail drops is that before the Internet became as it is today, mail drops were actually one of the main communication methods or conduits by which people were able to not even just have an alternative media, but also for people to live, shall I say, alternative lifestyles. Uh, and, and such. So actually, mail drops were, were quite important. And I still think that mail drops can be important today, especially if paper tripping is still viable. But of course, the question of paper tripping's efficacy is a, is a topic for another time. Okay, very good, very good. So uh, um, that uh, concludes the security culture section. Uh, now I want to move on to, uh, to agorism, which is I guess, probably my, my most uh, favorite one out of this. Uh, as far as we've discussed tonight. So Rayo had a concept of ethical enclave that he mentioned, uh, which uh, which is obviously black and gray markets, but I'll provide a little more uh, detail here momentarily. But it predates uh, Konkin's agorism. And I know we mentioned before, but I, I wonder if Konkin, actually, uh, if Konkin actually read some of Rayo's stuff, and that's where he got the idea. But we will unfortunately never know unless there's some some uh, letters that haven't been digitized of Konkins where he mentions Rayo or or uh, Vonu or anything like that. So, yeah, probably I'll never know, but an interesting thing to ponder. So I think the main difference that needs to be emphasized here is that uh, ethical enclaves uh, are optional. Uh, they're just a, yeah, they're a potential option for people who are, who are looking to Vonu. But to be an agorist, trading in the black and gray markets is a requirement, or frankly, you're not an agorist. <laughs> you're, so, uh, you're not an agorist, you're something else, I think is how uh, Konkin, Konkin said it. Is that right, Kyle? Yeah, he he was he very much sounded like Yoda. Do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> very good, very good. So, uh, there is one thing that that Rayo mentioned in regards to ethical enclaves specifically, um, <clears throat> or or black market uh, operators. Uh, quote: An ethical enclave may have similarities to a traditional black market, but the differences are significant. The mixed premise black market operator, while violating socialist laws, still holds at least subconsciously some of the premises embodied in laws. He may experience a depressing sense of guilt. He may act with a handicap of psychological conflicts. The enclave entrepreneur, however, disavows not only the, the particular instance of initiated violence, but the collectivist morality as well. He experiences an exhilarating sense of righteousness. He acts with confidence and certitude of psychological consistency. End quote. I like that, explan that explanation at the end, yeah. But uh, I, I don't know, do you, do you think... <clears throat> And this this would obviously I'm pretty sure this would pertain to the agorist. Do you, do you think the the concern that Rayo points out is uh, um, is a, is a valid concern, Kyle? 
I'm I'm a little bit conflicted, uh, to say the least. Um, mm-hmm. Same here. I, I think I think if we go back to what Konkin wrote about in an Agorist Primer, actually not the Manifesto but the Primer, um, Konkin did say there was kind of an open-ended explore, shall I say, an unexplored dimension of what he called Agorist psychology. You know, how do people you know trade in the uh, gray and especially black markets? without feeling guilty, because remember, there's also kind of an emotional component of sorts that the state likes to try and impose upon people who are trading peacefully in the black market. Uh, what Actually, if we're going to go to objectivism for a moment, it's what Ayn Rand called the, you know, the sanction of the victim. And so, uh, you know, if people start feeling guilty about disobeying unjust laws... Then, then that's uh, whew, that's that's a little bit of its own uh, conundrum, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely is. I, I, I can, I can, I see his point. I, I definitely do, and, and I'm sure it applies to some. You know, I, I'm definitely sure it applies to some. But, uh, but, but I'm sure there are agorists out there. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. Use Derek Rose as an example. I don't think he feels any guilt. <laughs> I don't think he feels any guilt. So I, I think it just depends on the individual, and um, obviously, there's a lot of other variables that come into play there. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, there, there's another interesting point, and this is this is uh, compared. This this is obviously a uh, um, something similar to to what uh, what uh, to to Konkin and agorism. Quote: Ethical enclave trading profits uh, participating individuals and promotes liberty in general by reducing the plunder available to the collectivist government. Plunder, which would most probably be used to finance further violations of liberty, plus propaganda to rationalize the violation. End quote. Kyle, that goes along right along with starving the state. Starting yeah, the state. <laughs> yeah, and I think so. And because we are talking about uh, gray and black markets here, uh, that does sound. And again, I'm not an attorney. I do not have a license to practice law, and I don't play an attorney on TV. But I would say, just as a, a common man, a layman, that uh, that sounds like tax uh, evasion, actually. And of course, you know, I mean, this is counter economic behavior we're talking about. So of course, I, that would probably be the most accurate, arguably the legalistic uh, label to put on there, or for normal people, it's what would be called tax resistance, which of course encompasses both legal and illegal ways of uh, dealing with, uh, you may pay up or else, (laughs) which is what the government does with its tax codes and and so forth. But yes, the point is, is that, yeah, it is starving the state and the ethical enclaves or black markets do play their role in, in, in doing that, even if they uh, don't exactly, you know, cross their I's and dot their T's with certain uh, bureaucratic forms at a certain three-letter agency is very well-known and <laughs> infamously renowned for uh, you know insisting upon that you fill in the f- forms, even though it's a form of self-incrimination. But then the court said, it's not a form of self-incrimination because we said so, because we're a bunch of black-robed men. <laughs> I'm not sure what agency you're talking about, Kyle. I, I, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've never had any dealings with him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think we're all pretty familiar with it. It's, it's almost impossible for people not to be familiar with that uh, mm. institution, unfortunately. Uh, so the, the next point I have here, which, which you've kind of mentioned uh, um, briefly, is uh, his lack of faith in, in legal interstices. Uh, so he, he, wasn't, he wasn't explicitly against legal strategies. He definitely was not. Um, do you want to do you want to speak to that and maybe go a little more in depth uh, on that? Yeah, I think it's kind of should be stressed that Rayo and I don't remember right offhand whether it was explicit or implied, but either way, Rayo was much more of an engineer. He saw dealing with with Leviathan as more of a technical problem that you just solve through technology and and engineering and and just you know contraptions or methods or a very, dare shall I say, a very pragmatic and practical approach to uh, securing one's liberty. So it, it's really the invulnerability to coercion, which is what Vanu is. That's what this was really all about. So the distinction between legal and illegal, the entire what he called legal interstices, and I love that term for so many reasons. And anybody who's read any of my articles or even my anthology on reformism or anything else I've ever written knows that I uh, I do legal research and I look at the government's monopoly laws quite a bit, so I'm familiar with you know due process and a bunch of other things. But even I will say that Rayo's kind of dismissive attitude towards the law is not altogether unfounded. 
especially when you consider that the government basically engages in legal plunder, as Frederick Bastiat pointed out. So in terms of doing anything practically, you know, oh, I, I can do this kind of thing because it's illegal, but I can't do that other thing because it's illegal. Oh, my God, I might get in trouble. You know, Rayo, which is kind of like, first of all, everybody calm the hell down. And second of all, this is a technical problem. Let's treat it as such. And, you know, <laughs> if it happens to be illegal, obviously don't brag about it. Don't be an idiot about it. But at the same time, you know, just don't worry about it. So he was, let me put it this way, he was really ambivalent is the impression I get about whether something was legal and illegal and, oh, does it count as civil disobedience or not? Because some people actually do fret about that, by the way, in large oh, yeah. part because they don't do their own legal research and double check and, and all that. And again, the question of legal research and, and perhaps other t related topics like lawfare or legal opportunism is something to be saved for another time. But as regards to right now, with regard to Rayo, he was like, everybody calm the hell down. Let's just solve it as a technical problem. Come kind of, almost kind of like crypto in the spirit of something like crypto anarchism, but not limited to computers and the internet though. Just more as just an overall type of thing. You know, just don't worry about it too much. Well, you know, just as long as you're invulnerable to coercion, that's the most important thing. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and, and he was, I mean, I mean, these were different articles in different years. I remember in the, I think it was section one, uh, where he, he mentioned that legal interstices typically only lead to more laws. Uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a loophole, and once that loophole has been found out, they close down the loophole. Um, and then in other places, in other sections, I mean, he was like, sometimes you got it. Sometimes you you got to use these. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, sometimes there's no way around it. So I, I, I'm, I, I got the impression, like, uh, obviously the, the, the more, I guess, passionate argument was was about them li uh, legal interstices actually reducing freedom. Uh, well, it's the, the well, hold on. It's it's. I think what Rayo was concerned about was uh, the reliance on the legal interstices. Yeah. So just to use two examples, just very quickly in passing, because I know there's more things that need to be gotten to here. Uh, one example would be like the gun, the so-called gun show loophole. Arguably, that would be a legal interstice, at least in one sense. And another example, actually, if I remember correctly, Shane, correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, Rayo mentioned this explicitly, was the whole, uh, <laughs> the infringements against the right to travel, uh, more specifically driver licensure, vehicle registration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think he did mention that explicitly and said that, make sure to keep that all up because he has, he, he, simply because he didn't figure, hadn't figured out a better way to deal with that yet. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that is, that is very, very true. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. He, he definitely recommended that. Especially, like, obviously if you're going to be driving around in your van a lot. Uh, you either do that or you're probably going to lose your van. You have to spend a lot of money to get it back. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there are just some things and, and I, I wouldn't even call these concessions. They're just, you're trying to, you're trying to survive. Uh, and then, and there's, uh, I mean, and <laughs> although, uh, uh, unless you're utilizing state citizenship, which, which Kyle has written about, but then you're not necessarily, you're not really Vanu at all. So, cause you, you have increased, uh, coercion. Uh, just obviously when well, cops well, see you without just, license plates, they, they pull you over and they mess with you. Right. And very, just very briefly on, on the kind of state citizenship S type of stuff, all of that is legal interstices, by the way. And I didn't, mm -hmm. yeah. And obviously, you know, I wrote the primer on that, but yeah, now that I know about, you know, Rayo's concept of Vanu, yeah, the whole state citizenship approach is, is 100% legal interstices. And yeah, unfortunately, if you are going to, directly c confront the government in terms of uh, certain forms of, I guess, what some people would consider to be legal opportunism, uh, depending what you're doing, you know, it might not be as confrontational, but if you're going to do what the typical state citizens do, usually with directly confronting the police officers at the side of the road and insist that I don't need a license or whatever else, um, depending on how you handle that, it can be very uh, difficult to put it uh, slight. And again, the issue about right to travel is a topic to be saved for another time. But uh, what I'll say for now is just that uh, <laughs> the legal interstices and the, re and the reliance on legal remedies solely and not anything else like technology or just pragmatic techniques of just whatever the hell else – yeah, I agree with Rayo. There is way too much of a reliance on legal interstices, and I do legal research quite a bit at the time to write my articles. Mm -hmm. So yes, I do agree with him coming at it from the, I guess you could say, the other side. Yeah, yeah. What forty years later, a long time later. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, so at the end of his uh, uh, chapter on ethical enclaves, 
Uh, yes, this was probably in the late 1960s. I don't remember the exact date, um, but you can find that in the PDF. Uh, he has some interesting questions. Uh, quote, how might an ethical enclave operate? What is its potential in the present context? What are its problems and their possible solutions? To what extent do informal ethical enclaves already exist? What is the relative merit of an ethical enclave compared to other approaches to freedom in our time? So let's, and I want to, I want to try to answer these questions. Just uh, I think it'd be a good for good for a discussion. So, <clears throat> start with uh, how might an ethical enclave operate? Um, and actually, we'll do the first two. How might an ethical enclave operate, and what is its potential in the present context? Now, um, for those who haven't seen the interview I did with Derek Rose on Freedom Cells, go check it out. You can find it on the website or on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Liberty Under Attack. Uh, it's still right there at the one. It's the second to last video, so you can find it pretty easily. I think Freedom Cells have a like, a, especially from that interview. It seems like Freedom Cells have a, like they have their public and their private face. Um, <clears throat> and from from how, from the way Derek Bros or for the way, from the way Bros explained it, I think that might actually be a, a, a really good potential for uh, for said ethical enclaves. Uh, I, I I really do. Uh, what, what do you think? Well. Um... Just, just coming at it from a more security culture perspective, like if they're not vetting their people and somebody turns out to be a snitch, then you know somebody's going to get in trouble because they're engaging in counter-economic activity. That's the first thing I would think of. Mm-hmm. Uh, putting that aside, however, if we're talking just more nuts and bolts, um, you know, to use a real-world example, I mean, there was Silk Road for a while. And I know other people have tried to replicate that or bring it back or whatever, and that, that's more of a more digital version of it. Uh, perhaps some types of freedom cells could have like mini uh, so-called ethical enclaves of, of sorts. Um, I mean, the only other thing I can think of would be, and, and yes, some people may think this is derisive, at least in one sense. But if you think about your run-of-the-mill, run-of-the-mill like drug dealers and how they conduct business, I mean, technically those transactions, uh, you know, if, if it's just straight up, you know, money for the commodity, as it were. Then I mean that that's already kind of a, I mean that's black market, right? I mean that, that's that's yeah, economic and, activity. Informal, yeah, informal, yeah. So I mean that kind of that kind of stuff happens all the time, and especially with the cannabis smoke, smokers in particular, because there is a growing social custom of accepting uh, the 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 <laughs> the ingestion of one way or another of cannabis uh, as opposed to other types of uh, narcotics of one flavor or another. So. Whether we're talking about through a digital medium or like you know the so-called dark web like silk like a Silk Road, we're talking street deals, you know, one on one, or we're talking about something like a like a like a freedom cell or just something else. I mean, pick a label at this point. The fact of the matter is that there's a lot of different ways that, uh, and not just black markets but also gray markets can actually function. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And just to mention, is I saw this come across my uh, Facebook news feed. Uh, uh, Open Bazaar is, I guess, is the newest uh, Silk Road, and uh, I, I, I'm, I, the creators gave a speech at uh, Porkfest this year. Uh, it's not available yet, but I would definitely uh, be interested in watching that because uh, I, I've been on the website, I've looked it over a little bit, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about it. But that's that's supposed to be the, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, what, what's to, what's to follow uh, Silk Road. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Uh, not not well, really sure. Sorry, one thing I just thought of, and I would suggest the listeners double check, uh, go and, and watch the following video by Larkin Rose, which is entitled, I think it was The Supermarket. And in there, Larkin was describing how there was black market trading, counter-economic activity in prison. Okay, the government cannot keep out uh, the, hard, the so-called hard drugs out of their own prisons. So these ethical enclaves, as Rayo would call it, can really be anywhere. Now, obviously, you know, prison would not be the best place to be, right? I mean, that's not very – that's being very quite vulnerable to coercion, right, if you're an inmate? Yeah, not very vulnerable. Because <laughs> <laughs> like you're monitored all day, every day. Right. Yeah. No, no <laughs> privacy whatsoever. And, and Larkin kind of goes through some of that because, of course, as anyone know, who knows the story is that he was in prison for, for a year because of his uh, uh, so-called tax evasion case or whatever. Uh, but the point is that, you know, black markets can really prop up anywhere – even even in the harshest of conditions, as it were. So in terms of like their potential context and so forth, I mean, they can really just be anywhere. And what I've just mentioned just very briefly here is just, I mean, pick any flavor. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that that's a good point. And I guess here it may, might be a couple other examples, like uh, at freedom festivals, like uh, Pork Fest, where there's no business licenses or permits. Uh, um, obviously, no one's charging taxes. I mean, that's that's a gray market. Um, and then I, I would even go so far as to say that, uh, like Craigslist. I'm, I'm sure, God, I, I don't want to meet these people if this actually happens. I don't ever want to come across them. The people that actually like write it off on their tax forms, like their 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 sales on Craigslist. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, w- wouldn't Craigslist be like? I mean, since I mean, I would say 95 percent of people probably don't report that on their taxes. Do you, that's probably that's that's some sort of an ethical enclave. Someone, someone's uh, getting rid of a uh, service or a good that someone wants. They meet and they exchange and they go on their way. Uh, I think that's that that could potentially be an ethical enclave. What do you think, Kyle? I I suppose that would arguably be more gray market, and and maybe, mm-hmm. maybe perhaps we're getting a little bit into semantics. But yeah, I mean, like for example, uh, when Eric English does his videos about like, oh, I I did here's my here's my haul for my latest round of like uh, you know. Uh, going to the garage sales and reselling and all of that, and he shows it on camera and such. You know, maybe some of the some of the other people he's been trading will do things like what you're saying. I'm not casting any aspersions on Mr. English, of course, uh, for reasons of you know keeping him out of prison. Uh, but 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 obviously, I think it's more than fair to say that I think it would be kind of naive to assume that there aren't people. Uh, whether through Craigslist or maybe even uh, eBay, which would be interesting to see if the, how that would work. Uh, yeah, I'm are, pretty, pretty sure eBay does taxes. It's, it's been years since I've done it, but yeah, I would, I would think they probably do. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that there's definitely opportunities if, if people are willing to uh, look to see where they are and if they're willing to you know, uh, take, uh, you know, take on some risk, even if it's only low risk. And again, the, 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 uh, the topic of tax resistance is, is safe for another time. But as far as here goes, yeah, I mean uh, – People can be very creative in terms of their accounting. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to. Apparently, yeah, that makes sense. eBay wouldn't have a tax. Yes, th- that's what I was going to say. Yeah, the, if you if you if I purchase from someone in Illinois, there'll be an Illinois state tax. But if I purchase from someone outside of Illinois, there 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 won't be unless that yeah, there won't be. So, we answer that next question: To what extent do informal enclave uh, ethical enclaves already exist? Now, this is kind of a, a more of a projection question. What is the relative merit of an ethical enclave compared to other approaches to freedom in our time? Well, Kyle, uh, I think uh, uh, other approaches, uh, I think ethical enclaves or agorism are, uh, are, are far more viable to actually uh, bring freedom in our time than, uh, uh, than going and blowing politicians and such, you know, uh, with reformism and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, at this point, any form of direct action that has not been objectively disproven, I think, really is is pretty much uh, is is pretty much either provably viable or potentially viable. You know, something that's either proven or, uh, shall I say, unproven. It's more experimental, kind of like what Bitcoin used to be. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the relative merits. Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much as long as we're not talking about disproven methods like some forms of direct action or probably more importantly, every single thing that's reformist, every single technique, then yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, you know, the sky's the limit. And, uh, you know, if more people were sincere about securing their freedom, and I would also say more transparent too, and entering into the alternative media with its, you know, fantastically wonderful low barrier to entry – then uh, you know people can start you know crowdsourcing as it were the results of uh, whatever the hell they're trying to do at least with certain types of things, and then other people can see oh that thing actually works or maybe perhaps if something doesn't work you know going down that freedom umbrella and yeah, saying oh yeah definitely definitely so that uh, feedback what, is important yeah 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 that, that's uh, that's that's definitely true and and I'll, I wanted to mention this in regards to ethical enclaves or agoras and whatever whatever the listener likes prefers to call it but I mean obviously. <clears throat> Um, with agorism, there, there's a, obviously there, there's a, I guess a little checklist thing or like a, a process, and yeah, the end goal is to to starve and then smash the state. Um, but even but uh, I think even Rayo mentioned like he he does he's not very optimistic about like uh, uh, like a of like a free society. Um, so so speaking to that, even just individuals operating in the ethical enclaves or or, uh, or agorist markets. They can still increase their own personal freedom 
And I think that's uh, um, that's another aspect that can't be overlooked. Even if, like, let's just say worst case scenario, um, Agora's like, let's just say like Agora's ethical enclaves for some reason. I don't know. Like the the state starts starts uh, um, lashing out pre uh, pre uh, the uh, um, I guess the shrinkage of the state. Um, they can at least um, <clears throat> I guess increase their own personal liberty. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. In in the here and now, and especially for those people who are willing to take on the risk. And look. Just, just to mention this more in passing, whether the advocates of so-called limited government like it or not, whether they call themselves constitutionalist American patriots or some other similar title, the fact of the matter is that right now, today, you and I are living in what Sam Conkin described as a low-density agora society. So for those people who may want to uh, restore the republic or, or you know, something with a, a constitutional paper cage or, or whatever the hell the version of their goal happens to be this week, because depending who you talk to, they sometimes might be running for office, but then other times they're not. So good luck trying to make that happen. But of course, nobody wants to talk about committees of safety, which I find intriguing for other reasons. Um, the fact of the matter is that right now is a low density agora society. Now, whether that develops or not is, is more of a question of, of history as we make it, uh, in, in other words. But that's just what it is. So I think as the, the downward class migration that Jack Spierko talked about in that one video of his continues to happen, then I think you will see more and more people really kind of take their own destiny in their own hands and, yes, take on some risk in more than one way, and they will uh, grow – what uh, even the government would refer to as the so-called underground economy. So I think that's really kind of where things are heading. You know, this this whole, you know, grandstanding, let's go fall on a sword in Oregon like we're a bunch of dipshits, is not really convincing. And whining about public land and public property and public health and all these socialist ideas that the patriot movement has been promoting in recent months – is I don't think it's rather convincing to anybody. So I think it pretty much at this point, for their purposes, they should, you know, I think for, uh, for their own ideology, committees of safety are pretty much where it's at, so put up or shut up. And for everybody else, I think that, uh, yeah, the, that, that certain types of things, like counter-economic activity and other things, would be a better option for them. Hell, I mean, for certain types of things, I don't see why the Patriots couldn't participate in certain counter-economic activities. That, well, well, wait, that's almost bad to say because some of them are political prisoners because of that, aren't, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, but so that, that, that so, was the lack of security <laughs> culture was the result of – that's why that happened. But yes, you, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry. Look, I don't mean to laugh at the political prisoners, but this is something that has to be considered. As history is being – is ongoing and is – as it's happening, as it's being written, because you and I wrote about the origins of the Harney County Committee of Safety, this is something we're kind of looking at are different parallel developments of people's, well, as the Austrians would say, human action. Remember, human action is purposeful behavior. So what is so the more fundamental question here is, is this specific type of behavior actually purposeful? And yeah, when people are engaging in trade that the government may not like, I would suggest that, yeah, quite a, at least a quite a bit of that behavior is purposeful, if not all of it, or nearly all of it. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that that is definitely true. And even even Mises mentions in Human Action. This is actually part I've gotten through already. Um, <clears throat> I mean, any, well, I guess any any um, attempt to improve one's condition is is purposeful behavior. Uh, and and, and as him as economist, he, he like he he won't judge that, but. As just a, an, an average person, you can you can definitely judge the efficacy of the tactics utilized by some of these folks. Um, but yeah, we are uh, we are over. I guess we're going into overdrive just for a few minutes. But uh, uh, but yeah, so I guess any any closing thoughts, Kyle uh, and Stan, as well uh, before we uh, begin to wrap up. Well, what I would just say is that people should really read and or listen to Rayo's book on Vanu and then really kind and then after they have bathed themselves in the in the literature really sit down and ask themselves if they really are content with their own lifestyle if they're willing to submit themselves to the 9 to 5 grind if they like living in suburbia if they like being a conspicuous consumer and all of the fascism that that entails 
or if they would rather actually have some measure of freedom away from central planning and being much more entrepreneurial in our, or, or what, what was the, hold on, what was the term, Shane, that I think Rio used, like, like having the freedom to pioneer in freedom or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. Yeah, I don't remember the exact quote, but yeah, you're, you're, yeah, that's, that's that's close enough. Yeah. Yeah, and and so yeah, I mean, are people satisfied with uh, having the mortgage? Are they satisfied with having to obey the dictates of a boss and everything that that implies? Or are they willing to yes, take on some risk? And yeah, for some more than others. I mean, whether they want to keep everything legally squeaky clean or or for some people, I guess not. Either way. Uh, you know, are they willing to make a substantial change in their own lives to pursue freedom in the here and now? And I think Rayo's own example is, 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 if nothing else, a very good primarily – I'm trying to find the right word here, but, but, but fascinating and wonderful – I wish I had a thesaurus right now, but basically <laughs> – but basically, a, here we go, triumphant. It's a really an tr example of a triumphant role modeling. And so when you look at guys like Rayo or Sam Konkin or some of these truly good libertarian role models, it kind of makes the guys who are the uh, more well-known names like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the fellow with the fake southern accent or – the guy, or, the, or the guy with the, the not-so-fancy hair who keeps flip-flopping every other, or let's say the other guy who specifically repudiated the non-aggression principle or some yeah. of these other jokers. It really kind of if, – if let me put it this way. If you were to take the example of, of, of those older guys who wrote these books and explain how to change your life fundamentally, and then you look at uh, the current uh, loudmouths who have nothing to offer you in your family – and you just gauge them only on, only in terms of role modeling. I think most people would arguably kind of gauge that uh, the guys who were pushing for direct action of one flavor or another actually had something substantive to to put to the table, as opposed to uh, let's just have you know you know a two percent sales tax cut this year. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is definitely true, and I, I would recommend uh, uh, all of our all of I recommend everybody, but especially uh, especially our listeners. Uh, and, and readers to go check out. Uh, uh, just go to libertyintertech.com and just search for Vanu, and just check out the endless amount of art. Well, I guess not endless; it, it does end. But uh, there's a lot of material there that you can look through, um, uh, whether it's mirrored articles or actually Rayo's book. And these can give you some insight on like people are actually doing this stuff. Uh, exactly. They are doing this stuff. Uh, did you say something, Kyle? Nope, I was. I okay, was just, okay. I was must, just must, have, I must have got some, some sort of feedback on mine. I thought someone stepped in, but uh, but yeah, these people are actually actually doing it, and uh, um, it, they they provide good examples to to emulate. If if we are really going to be serious about uh, restoring restoring freedom, and uh, and I've, obviously I, I've said this before, and I'm going to add on to it. Obviously, if, if if you're not mentally free, it's hard to become physically free, and if you're reliant on others for your freedom, uh, you probably you're probably going to have a bad time. Um, and that, that's what we're trying to do with this direct action series is give you the – give you some options, a lot of options on creating that freedom that you so desire to where you, you, you don't have to uh, um, attach yourself at the hip, at, at the hip with, liber, liber, with the uh, anti-libertarian libertarian party uh, or, or, or the uh, Republican candidates Gary Johnson and William Weld. Um, <clears throat> So you can you, you can actually take the initiative and, and you can do it now without uh, without uh, this this really long gradual push towards libertarianism that that some people think that, that this might actually lead to. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I got there. Yeah, and one other thing too, I just something you said sparked an idea in me. There, you cannot have cookie cutter solutions to the problem of tyranny. Some things will work better than others. But in a lot of ways, it's also rather important to tailor make your own options. I mean, hell, the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action is itself a market selection of libertarian resistance to the state. And so some things will I mean, you know, what work what may work for you individually may not work for the man standing next to you. So so a good portion of this will involve people kind of in their own personal lives experimenting with certain things. I mean just one, one thing very briefly. Not everybody is cut out for off-grid homesteading. Not everybody 
is cut out or, or otherwise would be willing to use the against me argument in, uh, <laughs> in certain types of um, extended family uh, get togethers, like where you meet the relatives of, you know, my, you know, so many degrees out at like the annual Thanksgiving event or the annual uh, anti Independence Day on July 4th and so forth. Uh, where where people are just kind of uh, oh you're making nice nice and oh by the way oh you think ta- oh you think taxes are wonderful well do you want me thrown in a cage for you know uh, not paying the taxes so hey you know some people are not cut out for that they don't want to they don't want, but they, but that same person who may not want to use the against me argument may want to I don't know use uh, use something completely different in turn I mean hell they might be even willing to engage in civil defiance you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And uh, oh, yeah, I guess on that point, you brought it brought up another thought. Uh, yeah, watch for the uh, Title IV flag code violations. Uh, uh, here come uh, Anarchy Day, uh, and uh, that that's that, that's a fun one. Yeah, I've told told people, yep, yeah, you know, you like uh, this is in Florida, you should be facing a hundred dollar fine uh, and or thirty days in jail. So just keep that in mind. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, and, and this is. Yeah, I guess I guess I'm out of uh, out of out of thoughts on this subject. I, I just really hope that people find uh, people actually see the value in the in the this direct action series because I don't think anyone's done anything like this before. Um, I, I really don't. And I hope people see the value in the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action. Actually, utilize it because if no one utilizes it, then uh, it will help us. But but we're, we're trying to to push this out to more people uh, because obviously the solution of this solution to to, to tyranny. Um, I, I guess uh, tyranny needs to be stopped. I guess I'll kind of leave it at that. Well, yeah, and what, we're, what we've been doing with, with the DAS series just more generally is really just in a lot of ways kind of being our own uh, open source think tank of sorts, which I don't think is a concept really many people would even be slightly familiar with. But yeah, we're, we're looking at a lot of literature and, and looking at people's actual empirical results whenever there's evidence of that, and we try to kind of, you know, reason it out and figure it out and all that. And so specifically with what we're doing here tonight is we're comparing, I guess you could call it comparative VANU, and just seeing, okay, here's Vanu with frugality or security culture, survivalism, agorism, et cetera, et cetera. And how do these different, uh, you know, ways of acting, of human action, how do they stack up? Uh, you know, are there are some things more efficacious than others? Are they mutually exclusive or not? And I think that's very important to do. So, yes, I hope people read uh, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, and really ask themselves, hey, look, you know, do I want to change my life for the better? And, you know, I may not want to go 90% with uh, what Rayo said, but maybe I can go 20 or 25% and at least do that much to become as invulnerable to coercion as possible.